think the system might be. Okay. How about now? Hi everyone and good afternoon. Thanks for coming to our workshop and I would like to welcome you all to the third edition of Omnidirectional Computer Vision Workshop organized in conjunction with IEEE Computer Society Conference on Computer Vision and Pattern Recognition 2022. This year, June 19th and 20 marks uh, Juneteenth, a US holiday commemorating the end of slavery in US and a holiday of special significance in this US South. So we encourage all the attendees to learn more about the event and its historical context and to join the city of New Orleans in celebrating this holiday. You can find more information about that in the CBPR website. So uh, Woodscape Challenge 2022 is designed to advance the state of the art and to benchmark techniques for object detection on fisheye images. Uh, Woodscape comprises four surround view fisheye cameras and nine tasks, including segmentation, depth estimation, 3D bounding box detection, and a novel soiling detection. Semantic annotation of 40 plus classes at the instance level is provided for over 10,000 images. With Woodscape, we would like to encourage the community to adapt computer vision models for the fisheye camera instead of using naive rectification. We want to encourage the development of new models that natively operate on omnidirectional imagery, as well as close the performance gap between perspective image and omnidirectional algorithm. So this workshop has four invited speakers from both academia and industry and eight accepted papers authors. Uh, with this, I would like to invite Sharvanan to talk more about the Woodscape Object Detection Challenge winner. Hello all, uh, Hello. Uh, I'll share my screen in a moment. Uh, so the organizers, uh, can you switch the screen sharing? Uh, yeah, can you try now? Okay, just give me a moment. All right, so uh, hope you're able to see the screen here. Uh. Yeah, we can we can see on the Zoom. Okay. So. Okay. So uh, share it again. So let's just give it a quick check. Okay, so uh, can you guys see the screen here? Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah, you may have to switch to the switch the view in order to see the screen. So uh, hopefully you're able to see see this. Uh, all right. So. Uh, in this session, I'll be presenting the Omni CV 3.0 challenge, the fisheye object detection challenge on Woodscape for autonomous driving. So uh, I am Sarana Balaji uh, Ramachandran, and uh, so here's Ganesh, John, and Santal uh, organized. So uh, we organized this challenge together. So uh, so why fisheye? So fisheye cameras. Uh, generate a large field of view and allow allow us to see a lot of things, which is very useful for autonomous driving and for detecting objects, for example. So we'll be able to see a lot of objects from uh, the sensor data, but this is, an, but this is a non-linear mapping, which means uh, the rectangles generated here as shown in this image uh, will not stay as rectangles in the rectified image. So uh, for this challenge, we chose object detection as the uh, task and uh, we want to actually advance the, uh, the objective is to advance the state of the art uh, and to benchmark techniques for object detection on fisher images. So uh, the challenge started on April 15 and uh, uh, it ended on June 5. It, it was held for 
a period of 52 days. So uh, the data set was uh, Woodscape and it has uh, 40 plus classes, but for object detection, we chose the most important classes uh, that, that's required for autonomous, uh, autonomous driving. So uh, these are the classes here from uh, mocked from zero to on the, on the table on the right. And the training set contains about 8.2 uh, K images. Uh, and the test set has about 1,766 images. So uh, the challenge was held in two phases. So the dev phase uh, is where the people can actually, so for both the phases, uh, we have the same uh, test set. However, for the test set, uh, for the dev phase, a random uh, thousand images will be chosen and this subset will be used uh, for uh, getting the scores in the leaderboard. And the test phase will be evaluated on all the 1,766 images. And uh, this is to prevent uh, all fitting the model on the data. And we, ch we change the uh, images chosen at random every week. So uh, uh, the test phase was just for two days and we allowed a maximum of only two submissions at the very end. Uh, so basically they have to build up the model uh, completely in the dev phase and then they can submit their results uh, for the test phase. So uh, as for the participation uh, and submission statistics, we had uh, about 120 global teams uh, and we have close to 2,500 submissions. Uh, the second half of the uh, challenge, we, we had a lot of submissions going on. Uh, we, we had about 46 submissions per day on an average. Uh, and you can see the graph in here sh showing the uh, number of submissions per day. So uh, uh, the leaderboard was displayed publicly after June 5. We froze the leaderboard, and uh, so here's the leaderboard. So we have a uh, we have Ground Truth uh, team, Ground Truth at the at the very top, and then He Beyong and IPIU. Uh, so the top three uh, leaderboard so uh, are highlighted in green here in, in the leaderboard. So and uh, as, so individual classes have also been shown here in the leaderboard, uh, this course. And uh, you may see for some classes, uh, the uh, not all teams perform uh, like really well in every single, depending on the strategy and the model that they used and the model architecture. So uh, moving on to the winner. So the, uh, we have team Ground Truth leading the uh, leaderboard and they'll receive a reward of thousand euros uh, through sponsorship from Lido. So uh, I'd like uh, to invite Team Ground Truth to, uh, to take the dice uh, and they'll present their idea on uh, how they actually achieve the score and how they top the leaderboard. Hello? Hello, everyone. I'm Xiao Xiang Lu from Xidian University. It's my honor to have this opportunity to introduce the method we use during the Woodski Fisheye Object Detection Challenge for autonomous driving. This is our team information. We are a team of students from Guangzhou Institute of Technology of Xidian University and the School of Water Conservation and Hydropower of Xi'an University of Technology. This competition is designed to advance the state of the art and to benchmark techniques for object detection on fish eye images. The goal of object detection is to predict the set of bounding boxes and category labels for each object of interest. Recently, automatic and effective object detections plays an important role in seeing passing on fish eye images. In this case, the main tactic to predict the bounding boxes of object detection of objects of five predefined classes, including vehicles, person, bicycle, traffic light, and the traffic sign. However, as shown in the pictures, fish eye images have all RAM characteristics, including skill variance, complicated 
the background filled with distractors and nonlinear distortion, which pose enormous challenge for generating object detectors based on common convolution networks. So to deal with these problems, we propose some targeted uh, methods and strategies to begin with for facial imagery with large scale and complex scenes to improve semantic scrambleability and uh, alleviate category confusion. Collecting and sourcing the same information from a large number of who can be useful in learning relation, relations across objects. But for convolution network, the locality of the op convolution operation limits is capacity for capturing global context information. In contrast, transformers are capable of global focus on the dependencies between imagery feature patches and retrain sufficient special information for object detection via multi-hand self-attention. In this work, we introduce a multi-hand self-attention block in the original backbone that's been dark night to bring more context information and more discriminatory feature representations. Here is the um, MHA assay dark block to this specific MHA dark block. We use multi hand repetition with N layers to replace N steps P bottlenecks, each of which consists one, three times three special convolution, one, one times one special convolution. And the structure of the repetition layer is described in the right figure. Object from the fish eye images will vary a lot in size via the feature map from a single layer of the convolution neural network have a limited uh, capacity of uh, rep repetition. So it's crucial to effectively represent and the precise multi scale features. In this work, we present a simple yet high effective weighted bi directional feature pyramid network for effect effectively cross scale feature fusion. For the um, BIPN as an edge from the original input to the output node, if they are at the same level, in order to fuse more features without and the um, um, much core second, we are combining low level and high level features. BIPN introduce a learnable ways to learn the importance of different input features in, in, instead of uh, simple summing up or concatenating which may cause feature mismatch and uh, performance uh, degradation. In addition, we implement other effective uh, strategies, including test time augmentation and, and modern loops to improve the detection performance. Test time de um, augmentation and application of data augmentation to the test site. Uh, we create uh, multi, uh, we create multiple augmented copies of each image in the test site. Having the model make a prediction for each and then returning an ensemble of these predictions. Copies of samples in the test data site are created with some image man manipulation techniques performed, such as fleece shapes and more. As we all show, as well as we all know, mm, command, commanding prediction from different models generalize better and usually is more accurate results compared to a single model. In this work, we adopt an effective method of combining weights of object detection models and modern soups. Modern soups separate the weights of multiply models found with different hyperparameter configuration to improve accuracy and robustness without incurring any additional inference or memory cost. Here are some details of the training. The time used for training is 200 epochs. A uh, single skill training with an input image size of 536 times 536 is used. An SVG optimizer with an initial learning rate of 0 0.01 and on process of 16 and a VTK of 0 0.0005 are used. Here is our final network architecture. First, input the image to in, into the MHSA dark night backbone to extract features for the detector. The feature maps are further refined with aggregation network BFPN, which aggregates features from deeper background levels for different stack levels. Finally, YOLO detection hand is 
template to predict bounding box that have five different uh, skills. Ex experiments all uh, have also proven that this method of stretch can indeed improve the accuracy as many previous work shows. Here are the results of our experiments. As we can see, after integrating multicast optimization into the original CFC.net, the total MAP results are significant boosted from 0 0.459 to 0 0.4727 and BIP for the performance by 0 0.4773. After time time augmentation operations, the performance improves a little extent. Finally, we use several models based on skill you will wait for a tree on the, the uh, wood skips design. Then we use um, ensemble master model soup to obtain the final model to prediction. To predict, the final prediction achieves 0 points. Four eight nine three. Here is the little boss uh, challenge. Our master the chips the same of the earth in the test phase and maybe of zero point five one. Self attention has a big effect in detecting small objects, which is considered to be an important and hard problem to this deploying object system in the real world. For same based the deep networks the high level feature maps are for fairly low spatial resolution, which leads to the lack of unbroken information to localize and recognize the small objects, where small objects always show the quarries for um, of certain classic image, which to some extent ex explains the reason why the transport-based model which focuses on global context information helps for accurate detecting small objects. Here is a realized comparison between prediction results from the original baseline and the average transformer based model. We can observe that average transformer based successfully recognizes the bicycle wheel, the baseline model wrongly classifies it into vehicles. It suggests that the improved backbone MHSA Dark Knight is capable of extracting more different features for, uh, for object detection via multi hand self attention and detriments a st stronger semantic describability to elevate uh, category confusion. That's all. Thanks a lot for your listening. Thank you, Shalwan and team Ground Truth for uh, giving us the insight on Woodscape Object Detection Challenge 2022. Uh, I would also like to inform all the attendees and participants that uh, we have t-shirts sponsored by Qualcomm at our desk and people can grab one at their convenience. So now I would like to invite our keynote speaker, Professor Juho Kanala from Alto University, Finland. He is an assistant professor of computer vision in the Department of Computer Science at Alto University and an adjunct professor at the University of Oli. He also co-founded Spectacular AI, which is a university spin-off company providing solutions based on computer vision, spatial AI, and sensor fusion. Today, he would be talking about the journey of his amazing work with Canada Brand Model. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for the organizers for inviting me to talk in this workshop. 
So I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the fissile lens model that we, we proposed in our early papers uh, from 2004 and 2006. So here is the presentation outline. So first I will talk about the background and motivation that how we uh, started studying the problem of the silence calibration. Then I will briefly present the uh, models that are usually used for designing the silences and then present the generic camera model that we proposed in our works. And then I will also show some examples of using that model to calibrate catadioptric cameras, which consist of a camera and mirror. And finally, a few words about the impact and later developments after, after this early work. Uh, so this uh, work for developing the fissile lens camera model actually started uh, when I was doing my master's thesis uh, in 2003 and 2004. So there was this kind of Finnish company which was doing uh, imaging of underground pipes with fissile lenses. So there, they had this kind of tractor that is shown on the picture here. And there was a fissile lens camera in front of the tractor and it was moving inside the pipe. And this company was interested to know that whether this uh, these video sequences could be also used for making three-dimensional measurements of the pipes. So the main uh, purpose was to manually inspect the videos and get to know about the condition of the underground pipes through manual inspection. But they were interested in like recovering 3D, uh, 3D models of the, of the pipes. And um, my task was to study methods for reconstructing the shape of the pipes from the fissile lens videos. So here I will show one example where the camera is moving inside a concrete pipe. Uh, there is lots of texture here on the concrete surface. So in this kind of case, it would be possible to use structure from motion. So track some feature points from the surface of the pipe, reconstruct them in 3D, and then fit some kind of surface model to those reconstructed 3D points. And then there was also a possibility to add a structured light sensor in case there would be like textureless pipes. So the idea was to track uh, Harris corner points from the video and then I use standard structure from motion methods for, for 3D reconstruction. But the first challenge was the geometric calibration of the PSI camera. And that was a new problem to us at that time. <coughs> And, and I started like familiarizing myself with the literature and learning what, what uh, kind of models people use for fissile lenses. And uh, here is a, this kind of simple illustration of a fissile lens. So um, they often have a very wide field of view, close to 180 degrees. So the field of view covers the full, full hemisphere in front of the camera center. And let's see if I can use my laser pointer. So the thematic drawing here shows uh, uh, how, like, how the light rays from the scene point B arrive to the image plane of the camera. So in perspective camera, the projection is, is perspective projection and the image point would be this point Q indicated with the dashed line. But in a fish lens camera, uh, the projection is different so that when the ang angle between the incoming light ray and the optical axis of the camera grows, the point on the image plane should not go infinitely far. So that's why, why the projection must, must be different when the field of view increases. And from literature, we can find that fissile lens are designed 
often using certain mathematical projection formulas. So here we have um, plotted the projection curves of several different camera models. So we have on the uh, horizontal axis, the angle theta between the incoming light ray and the optical axis of the camera. And on the vertical axis, we have the radius. So the radius on the image plane between the projected point and the principal point. So here the distance area is shown here on the image plane. So the principal point is where the optical axis intersects the image plane. And here we can see that uh, for perspective projection, the projection formula is this tangent function. So the radius grows infinitely large when the angle theta approaches 90 degrees. But then for these other models, uh, error stays finite, even if we have 90, 90 degree angle, or the value for theta is 90 degrees. And fissile len lenses often follow some of these other projection models. And our goal was to develop a generic model that, that could be applied to all kinds of cameras like this. So at that time, there were no widely used generic models for fissile lenses. And we decided to model this radial projection as an odd function consisting of the odd powers of the theta angle. And depending on the accuracy, one can add more terms to this function. But we found out that uh, in most cases, these five terms shown here provides a very good approximation for most radially symmetric central cameras. And in practice, all fissile lenses uh, are, are these kind of radially symmetric central cameras. And when this uh, projection function is combined with an affine mapping that maps the coordinates from the image plane to pixel coordinates, we get a generic model for radially symmetric central cameras. So this radial uh, projection function there is here and then this is the unit vector on the image plane. And then the affine mapping from the metric coordinates on the image plane to pixel coordinates U and B is defined here. So we could have three parameters in this transformation matrix if the pixel columns and uh, rows are not orthogonal. Uh, but then, um, these kind of classical lens distortion models that were used before for regular cameras, they often contain also asymmetric terms to account for decentering lens distortion. For example, there is this kind of classical paper by uh, Conradi from 1919, where uh, formulas are derived for this decentering lens distortion based on optical principles. But in our work, we took a different approach. So we didn't use um, optical principles, but we just uh, proposed this kind of flexible mathematical model, uh, which, which can be fitted to observations. So we have the radial symmetric part in the model. That's the first term here. But then we add two terms, where the other is to the radial direction and the other is to the tangential direction. And the magnitude of these terms, they are defined by these functions delta r and delta t. And these have also this kind of generic form. So uh, the functions are a product of two terms. But the first one is this kind of uh, polynomial similar to the radial projection function. And then the second term is a Fourier series. So it's periodic uh, with respect to the angle V. And basically also here we could add more terms to, to these uh, factors, but we found that 
this kind of model with these turns turns out to be uh, a good compromise so we get a precise model for um, different kind of distortions uh, without that adding too many parameters so whether these kind of asymmetric turns are important depends on the quality of the lens so if it's made very precisely to be radially symmetric then it may not be needed but if there are deviations then these additional terms may be useful and <clears throat> then we proposed um, a method for calibrating the values of the model parameters so the calibration process is based on using several views of a planar calibration pattern and the calibration pattern can be a checkerboard pattern or any, any pattern with, with known control points. And there are multiple stages in the approach how we um, get the good enough initial guess for all the parameters so that we can then finally refine uh, the, the parameter values through nonlinear optimization. So uh, first we uh, initialize the internal parameters. So basically we use a simplified model where we have just two terms in the radial projection function. And these two terms can be initialized based on manufacturer's data. Uh, so usually, for example, it's roughly known what kind of projection model the camera may follow and what is the maximum field of view. And then that kind of information is sufficient to initialize uh, these two parameters uh, accurately enough so that we can then back project the uh, measured coordinates of control points onto a camera centered unit sphere. And then we estimate the homography between the calibration plane and the unit sphere centered at the camera center. And from these homographies, we can initialize external camera parameters. And then we have initial guess for both the internal and external camera parameters. And we can refine the values of the parameters by minimizing projection errors via nonlinear optimization over all, all parameters. And here is an example uh, where fisheye lens camera has been calibrated using only one calibration image but in practice one should use more views so just capture several views of the calibration plane and then use the previous algorithm to optimize the camera model parameters and on the right hand side we show uh, how, how the uh, image is rectified after uh, calibration so we can rectify central part from this fisheye view uh, to follow perspective model. And in the perspective version of the image, all straight lines should be straight. And that seems to be the case. So there are some structures in this, in this room which are straight lines and they appear to be straight. And in practice, <clears throat> here we had this kind of very large, uh, pre precisely manufactured plane. But nowadays, it's very easy to use uh, flat, flat screen displays to display the calibration pattern. So one doesn't need to print, print any patterns. One can just show the pattern on, on a flat screen display. And it's not important to know the absolute scale. It's, it's enough that the checkerboard pattern is on, not not be stored on the on the display and depending on how many parameters we use on the camera model uh, we uh, get varying fits to the data so naturally when we have more parameters we get a better fit to the data and this can be ver verified so that if we have independent test images which are not used in fitting uh, and if the model with more parameters still fits better, probably there is no overfitting and uh, the model with more parameters provides a more accurate model for the camera. 
So these values are in pixels. So um, with the mo model with most parameters, we get quite a quite low root mean square error for the residuals. But al already the basic model without the asymmetric terms gives a good fit for the, both of these fish islands. And here is a visualization of the asymmetric part of the model that was fitted to the other fish islands. So these arrows have been scaled by a factor of 150 to 8 inspection. So we see that um, the, distortion, the asymmetric distortion deviates the points that are projected to different locations of the image plane according to these arrows shown on the left image. And then the right image shows the residuals for the control points <clears throat> after the model was fitted. And it seemed to be relatively random. So there is not any more like much systematic error that could be modeled with, with even uh, better or, or um, or models that have more, more parameters. But of course, it depends on the lens that um, how many parameters one may need. And here is a visualization that how the noise affects the stability of the calibration. So this is done with synthetic data. So we took the values from this kind of real calibration experiment and then added varying levels of synthetic noise to the control point coordinates. And the measurement error, the root mean score measurement error, which is the, has the highest value here, that's the difference between the noisy measured control point coordinate and the true a pixel location of the control point. And then when we do the fitting, uh, we can get the modeled locations of the control points. And the estimation error, which is the lowest here, is the difference between the modeled location of the control point and the true location of the control point. And the third value is the residual error. So that part of the error that the model doesn't explain. And here we see that most of the noise uh, goes to the residual error. So the estimation error does not grow much, even though the noise uh, increases. So we get, so the optimization algorithm converges to, to the global optimum and we get a good fit. And the model doesn't change much, even if there is a large, uh, noise in the control point coordinates. Of course, this depends a little bit on the number of control points. If there is very little calibration data, then the noise affects more. But if there is a plenty of calibration images, then it, it doesn't hurt much, even if the uh, even if the <clears throat> uh, noise would, would be large. And the calibration method was implemented originally as a MATLAB toolbox, which is still available as open source software, and it has been quite widely used. And then there are nowadays also third party implementations of the model. So for example, open series fisheye camera model implements the radial symmetric part of, of this model. So uh, I already mentioned some of the practical hints for camera calibration. So because even this richest model that has, has 23 parameters, when we have both the radial asymmetric part and the asymmetric part in the model, that, that number of parameters is still uh, typically much less than the number of control points used. So if we have tens of calibration images and each one of them has like 
tens or hundreds of control points, then we have much more data points than, than the number of parameters and overfitting is not usually a problem. But if one wants to be extra careful, one can take an independent test set of calibration images and use them for validation. And the calibration pattern can be displayed on a flat screen display as, as shown here. Uh, so later, after we had published this model for fissile lenses, we wrote an encyclopedia ar article where we wanted to also study that how this model works for catadioptric cameras, which are usually designed so that all light rays pass through a single point. So most of the catadioptric cameras are also central cameras. So here are some examples of typical designs where the shape of the mirror and the location of the camera is chosen so that there is a single point in space where all the light rays projected onto the image plane actually pass through. So it's this point F in these models. And then there is an illustration of a real catadioptric camera that we use in some of our experiments. So there is a digital camera behind the, or below the mirror and the camera center is this white point here. So all the light rays projected to the image plane, they pass through this white point or, or close to that. And we found that the, our model works well in all cases we encountered and the asymmetric terms, they can compensate if there is slight non-centrality in the system. So if the mirror is not exactly positioned so that there would be a single camera center. And here is an example. How, so we calibrated this camera and after we take an image, we can undistort parts of the catadioptric image. And in the resulting images, straight lines appear straight. So the calibration has worked fine. So <clears throat> if uh, I summarize uh, some, some impact of, of the early work, so it all started uh, as, as solving a research problem in my master's thesis project. And thanks to these findings, we, we were able to calibrate the FISI camera that we had in the uh, Siever imaging device. And, and we were able to do these kind of 3D reconstructions of the underground pipes. But then I continued uh, uh, on, on camera calibration also during my doctoral studies. And this journal, journal article was published during my doctoral studies. And later the camera model and calibration tools, they have been widely used by researchers and practitioners in both academia and industry. So just to come back to the original research problem of the master's thesis. So here was the short video clip that we had as, as example data. And this is the FISI video. And after we did the calibration, we were able to apply standard structure from motion techniques so that we were able to get these kind of 3D reconstructions. So these Harris corner features are reconstructed into a 3D point cloud that looks like this antenna surface model can be fitted. And this was like proof of concept work, but similar principles can be used, of course, also in other environments if we have a fisheye camera, which, for example, could be in an autonomous car. And then during uh, or later, after we had published the uh, camera calibration papers, we have also looked at calibration problems for other kinds of sensor setups. So we published a paper about the calibration of RGBD cameras in 2012. So the, the idea was to propose a spatially varying distortion model for depth cameras, and then after that, we have studied sensor setups, which consist of cameras and inertial measurement units. So this is in the context of visual inertial odometry problem. So these inertial sensors, they often have these kind of biases that are hard to pre-calibrate, but it's possible to calibrate these biases uh, online 
if the camera is well calibrated and we have some recent work uh, in this area as well and this most recent paper was published this year in WACV it's called IPO so it's hybrid visual inertial odometry method uh, and that is actually the basis for real-time SLAM methods and other spatial AI technologies that we are currently commercializing in our spin-off company called Spectacular AI. I will here just show some brief video examples. So here this uh, visual inertial odometry method is compared to some other commercial approaches for the same problem. So this is data from a smartphone. So there is a single calibrated monocular camera and then a MEMS-based inertial measurement unit of the smartphone. And basically, all these commercial approaches are, are work uh, quite robustly. And our result is either comparable or better in some cases than, than the comparison methods. So I will. So here the ground, ground truth is obtained from satellite-based positioning, and then we can compare the trajectories of the different methods to the satellite-based ground truth. And this final video example shows the combination of all these sensors that I mentioned so Kinect device, for example, it has a color camera, it has a depth camera. Um, so the recent one is time of flight based. And then there is also an inertial measurement unit. And through our um, methods, we can track the movement of the device in real time in a relatively robust manner so that this kind of large scale mapping is, is possible. So this video shows how 1,000 square meter environment is mapped in 21 minutes using just a regular Kinect sensor. So this kind of camera calibration is one essential element that one can get this kind of precise odometry that doesn't drift too fast. So the better the odometry, the easier the loop closure problem becomes. Um, and in these kind of indoor environments, the loop closer may often be quite challenging because there may be repeating uh, textures and, and homogeneous surfaces. So I will skip a little bit. So this shows the top view of the campus environment that we mapped. So there are some automatic loop closures happening. So we can see that it corrects some of the mistakes and the resulting model looks like this. And, and the only sensor that is used is, is Kinect device. There are some holes the mapper didn't visit all, all the places, but essentially large scale geometry is, is right. And it's not so easy to get it right in these kind of large environments where there are repeating structures. So to conclude my presentation, uh, so this camera model, which is called in many contexts, Canela Brandt model, it's this kind of generic uh, camera model that is applicable to most central cameras. And it covers narrow and wide angle lenses, visi lenses, and most of radially symmetric catadioptric camera designs as well. And our open source camera calibration toolbox is widely used and the model has been included into various other software packages too. <clears throat> and in a, in a broader context, this kind of precise calibration of, of imaging sensors like color and depth cameras and their combination with inertial sensors, it's a prerequisite for efficient and robust vision applications in many, uh, many contexts like SLAM and 3D modeling. And the most recent developments uh, in this area, uh, we are currently like trying to commercialize 
some some of the research results in a, in a spin-off co company called Spectacular AI. And if you are interested, you can find more information from the web page of the company. So this concludes my presentation and thank you. Thank you, Professor, for your talk. Uh, does anyone have any questions? Thanks. Um, so in the calibration, one of the things I'm, I'm kind of curious about with the wide angle lenses is how, how precise does that calibration need to be? I mean, I know the better the calibration, the better the results. But how much of that could be, is, can you compensate via you know, like bundle adjustment in, in some correction to correct that distortion once you find loop closures? Do you have a sense for how accurate you need that wide, wide angle lens calibration to be? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood correctly, but you mean that with bundle adjustment, this everything could be like fixed afterwards when you have all the data. Yeah. And of course, that. That would probably work, but um, for efficiency and robustness reasons, it, it would be useful to have precise calibration, like so that you can you, you don't have too much ambiguity until the end. But but if you have resources to post process all the data, like as a post processing, I think that you may get equally good result. Uh, through through the bundle adjustment of afterwards. I wonder if uh, so I think that in this example that I showed for the Kinect, for, for calibrating the depth camera, we probably use just the standard model and values provided by the manufacturer. So in that example, I think that the novelty lies in combining, like fusing all these sensors, the inertial sensor, uh, depth sensor, and uh, cover camera, and not so much in the preciseness of the in the of the calibration of the individual sensors. Okay, I think there are no more questions, so thank you. So now I would like to invite Dr. Vito Guzlini from Toyota Research Institute, California. He is a senior research scientist with TRI, and today with us, he would like to give the talk on omnidirectional depth prediction for cars and his recent research in self supervised learning in multi camera systems.
Uh, hello, everyone. It's a great pleasure to be here today. My name is Vitor, Vitor Ghisellini. I'm a research scientist at, at the Toyota Research Institute, or TRI, and today I'll be talking about some of our latest works on self-supervised monocular depth estimation, particularly those pertaining to omnidirection and multi-view systems. So we are all probably familiar with the concept, but I think it's better to start with a brief explanation of the task at hand. So what is monocular depth estimation? Uh, in simple terms, it's the task of going from a single image to a depth map containing per pixel depth estimates that tells us how far objects are from the camera. Now, why do we want that? There are already range sensors like LiDAR, RGBD, capable of producing high quality point clouds covering the entire surrounding area around the vehicle. Our reason is simple, cameras, and especially single cameras, they are cheap, available everywhere. Uh, you can use mobile phones, dash cams, YouTube videos, they all contain cameras. And if you can find ways to transform those images into range sensors, essentially for free, even with some amount of degradation, it would be a big thing. And even better, those monocular point clouds are going to be dense, texture with color information, and aligned with the camera, which enables easy extensions to move task and facilitates the lifting up to the information to 3D space, essentially for free. So any image could become a 3D sensor by applying a depth network. And within the broader field of monocular depth estimation, we are mostly interested in self-supervision or learning without labels. So one thing to keep in mind here is that what I mean is not the standard self-supervision that we see in all these other workshops here at CVPR in many other conferences, like in contrastive learning or mask autoencoders. So what these methods do? They assume no prior information of the data, only one single label, and they find a way to transform those images in a way that changes the input but doesn't change the output. So if you add the crop, rotate, or mask parts of the image, and you can use these assumptions to learn useful patterns without those labels, with focus on pre-training for downstream tasks. Uh, but if you have videos, you are not truly working with raw data. That is a hidden label there, which is geometry. We can use um, geometric principles as proxy supervision for certain tasks and frame the problem, the optimization problem in such a way that these tasks are learned as a side project of simply following classic geometry rules. Uh, this is the case for depth estimation, optical flow, scene flow, wiggle motion, key points, and uh, many, many other tasks. So very, very briefly here, how does geometric self-supervised monocular depth estimation works. So we start with a target input frame, which is one frame from your camera. You assume only one camera that is moving through time. So we start with a target input frame, which is there. And then you run this frame to a depth network producing a predicted depth map. And at the same time, you run this frame and also on uh, another context frames, that could be the frame come from just before the image, or it has some striding, you could take the frame forward. So any frame, uh, that is close by, but not the same frame. So the camera has to be moving through time. And we run those two frames through a pose network that gives a transformation between frames. So both the depth network and the pose network work together to create these geometric constraints. We can then lift the, the 2D information from the target frame onto 3D using the predicted depth map. And we can use the predicted transformation to warp this point cloud from the target frame from the target camera's frame of reference to the context camera frame of reference. And so now you're you're warping information, assuming that you know the um, pose, the relative pose between those those two cameras. And then this and then we can use this warping, this warping operation to create a synthesized version of the target image using information only from the context image. In other words, we color each pixel in the target image using the corresponding information of where the pixel falls in the context image, uh, using bilinear interpolation to fill in the gaps when they're not there. So essentially, we're drawing information from one frame onto another and creating a synthesized version. And we can then compare the original target image with the synthesized context image using, uh, using some sort of uh, loss, usually the, full, the photometric loss. And bearing some limitations that I will be talking about later, these two images will be similar if and only if the predicted depth map and pose are correct. And that's the signal that enables us to learn from this task without any labels using only videos. So by just trying to minimize the difference between these two images, we learn depth and pose as a proxy task. So just by uh, enforcing these constraints in the loss at training time. 
so this is a simple example of this happening in uh, real time. So the yellow camera is the target camera and the green cameras are used as the context information. And each training step, we do the work in between cameras, produce a series of synthesized target image and pay the photometric loss between those and the target image. And slowly, or in this case, rather quickly, so this is each one of the steps of the neural network as it's being trained. The predicted depth map and the, also the point cloud that you are actually observing here. So that's the lifted to the information in 3D using the predicted depth map. Go from our flat planes to uh, accurate depiction of the red sphere that the camera is observing uh, in that particular example. So what can we do with that? So at TRI, we have been following this trend of self-supervised monocular depth estimation for a few years, and we have extended this vanilla approach in many different ways, addressing some of its limitation and enables new, new capabilities that were not possible before. Uh, a bit of a, of a shameless plug here. So if you come to the machine learning session tomorrow, uh, we're going to be talking about our latest work on, on multi-frame self-supervised monocular depth estimation. And if you come to our booth, we have like some monarch depth networks working on our phones that you can just check and take um, some selfies or depth fees, as we're calling it. Uh, so please come to our booth if you are curious about that. Uh, but given the scope of this work, I'll focus on three of, uh, of this workshop. I'll focus on three of our works that actually enable full surround perception, covering the entire area around the vehicle to produce a single consistent point cloud. So working more towards the multi-view 360 perception that I think is the scope of this workshop. Uh, the first one I'll be talking about today is, is aptly titled Full Surround Monodepth or FSM. It was presented last month at ICRA. Uh, I don't think I really need to, to explain why 360 degree perception is highly valuable and even more for autonomous driving. Uh, a vehicle needs to be aware of everything that is happening around it in order to make proper decisions. So RAND sensors can do that. They can provide this sort of information. But as I said before, we are trying to see how, how close we can get to, the, to that type of, of perception or to augment range sensors or to complement them somehow using only cameras, both a way to minimize costs and also for the scientific value of such advancements. For 360 perception, we need multiple cameras. So in this case, we have six cameras around the vehicle. And again, to minimize costs, we would like to limit the amount of overlap between those cameras so we can cover more area with as few cameras as possible. So this is how we came up with this six camera arrangement with a very small, very small overlap between each of the cameras. So uh, this arrangement makes it impossible to use stereo, like the standard traditional rectify frontal parallel stereo setting, as well as using the cross camera photometric constraints that I was talking about before, because you don't really have that much overlap between the cameras. So you cannot really do the work in a way that covers enough of the image to get enough of a self supervised signal. So, what is the solution we are proposing here? So, we're proposing uh, to use spatial temporal generalized stereo to address this sort of situation. So what do I mean by that? So, so far, what I was talking about was uh, temporal consistency between frames, which means that we consider, we consider frames in a video sequence in order to produce the loss that we're going to be self-supervising on. So we have the same camera in different time steps. In the generalized stereo case, we consider different cameras in the same time step. So we are warping information between them in the same way, but not considering the time dimension, we just consider the spatial dimension. Uh, which is useful, but not in this case, because as I said before, the overlap is too small. So in this work, we introduce spatial temporal constraints, which includes warp information between different cameras in different time steps. So we can take the forward camera, for example, move it forward a couple of time steps, and we can warp it towards the side camera in the current time step. So we are free to move around between all the available cameras, as it's easy to see that if done properly, this leads to an increase in the overlap between frames, which in turn leads to more self-supervised signal during training. And that enables the whole self-supervised framework that I was talking about to work in this very challenging setting for this test. What are the benefits of this approach? First of all, we led to state-of-the-art results so multiple multi-camera depth estimation benchmarks. Secondly, it gives us better cross-camera point cloud consistency because do it, um, 
not sure if I, if I said that before, but doing inference, we're still using single frames. So, and we're producing depth maps from each camera independently. We only leverage multi-camera consistency at training time. And because we're not doing that in the naive uh, solution, so when you're just applying the depth net for each camera and paying the loss only from a temporal setting, this leads to some serious point cloud misalignments as shown in the, in the top figure there. So we have three different cameras, three different uh, depth maps. As, as you try to align those, they don't really align because each camera is treated completely independently during training. Uh, but in our case, because we are trying to train everything jointly, you get the bottom figure, which makes the point clouds much better aligned uh, out of the box. So this is just after training, this is what the network gives you when you run those images through the depth network to produce the point clouds. Uh, and also importantly, the result the point clouds are going to be scale aware because that's not something that happens in the traditional cell supervised setting. Everything is scale up to a factor because from a 2D perspective, you cannot really get metric information. But in this case, we're assuming that we know the relative camera transformation between cameras in the same rig, in the same, in the same vehicle rig, which is metric. And then the, uh, this pose information, extrinsic information gets transferred to the depth network because it needs to keep everything consistent. And as a result, you get actually metric point clouds in a purely self-supervised setting, which is something that is very useful from a practical perspective, but it's actually very hard to do with any additional source of information. Uh, and finally, as a bit of a technical insights, we noticed that if we actually really need to use self-occlusion masks to cover the areas of the uh, vehicle that cover the camera. So if you train on those images because they don't really contain any use information for self-supervision, if you don't cover those during training, you get like very bad results. So that's something that was like not of a big insight, but useful enough to make this uh, solution actually works. So try to not put things in front of your camera when you try to use the image. So that's a bit of an insight there. Uh, so here are some of uh, depth estimation results on the dense depth for automated driving data set or DDADs, which is our own data set that we released a couple of years ago containing this sort of data. So this is available and everyone can play around with that if they want. On top, we have individual depth maps for each of the six cameras. And on the bottom, we have the actual point clouds reconstructed from the information on those cameras. So again, there is no post-processing step for point cloud fusion or alignment, everything is done at training time by enforcing the spatial temporal losses. And those point clouds are also scaled uh, because we have the known extrinsics between them that provide metric information for the depth network. And you have the same thing on uh, new scenes, um, which also contains six cameras around. On the bottom left images, you can see some overlaid uh, range points. I think it's kind of hard to see here, but you can see some dots on the side of each image showing how much overlap we actually have between those images. So that is not that much, but even so, it's possible to leverage this information to achieve this sort of results that I'm showing here. And this is a video showing uh, our vehicle moving and producing the actual uh, 360 point clouds by combining information for all the six cameras. On the left, you have the images that gets transformed into the depth maps. <laughs> And this color is also available on the monocular point clouds that we are creating. So we have six cameras here, they're colored by the camera number. And afterwards it becomes colored by the actual RGB value of each. Image. So again, uh, this point cloud brings all the information from the image perspective to a 3D, which makes it much easier to do semantic segmentation or 3D or 2D bounding box detection and lift that information to 3D. And so this is our first work that I wanted to talk about. So for the second work that I'll be discussing today, so it's entitled Neural Ray Surfaces, which was presented in 2020 at 3DV, a uh, joint work with uh, TRI and people from uh, TTIC, Toyota Technical, Toyota Technical Institute of Chicago. Um, in this work, we explore another hidden label present in all these works that I mentioned before the most people overlook, which is the camera model. I think that's more relevant for people here. Uh, if you remember, a key aspect of cell supervision is the lifting from 2G, 2D through 3D, followed by the projection onto another frame of reference. And this is only possible if we know the camera geometry. Is it pinhole? Is it fisheye? How, do this, how are these operations defined mathematically so I can use them to actually achieve lifting 
and projection. Uh, what if there are some unknown, unknown distortions or even worse, unknowable distortions like cameras operating underwater or behind the windshields? And if we don't know which camera is being used to record the video, can we still use this video as a source of self-supervision? And our answer to that, to that question is yes. And our solution here is to learn a per pixel camera model uh, using what we call neural ray surfaces. And as you can see here, this enables us to jointly learn depth, ego motion, and camera model from a wide range of cameras without any prior knowledge. So what I'm showing here is actually don't have any information, just have a video. We don't know which camera it was uh, uh, taken from. We don't know the pose or the motion of the camera between frames, and we don't know the depth map. So now we are actually removing all the available labels and just training from a video sequence. Uh, to achieve this, we extend the depth network, as I was showing before, to also produce, uh, to also include a ray surface decoder that estimates the direction of the real ray for each pixels as a unitary vector. So now we don't have like a closed form solution, uh, intrinsic matrix that lifts information. We actually have for each pixel a viewing ray that shows the direction where that pixel is pointing at. And if you have the depth information, you just multiply those two together and you get the actual 3D points. So this is uh, completely free to points at any direction. Every pixel can point in any direction. So that makes this model very generic. Um, so lifting is easy, but unfortunately projection is not as trivial because there is no closed form solution and doing training, you need to be able to project. So in our work, we approximate the projection as a nearest neighbor search on the dot product between the direct projections, so what, what you get if you project those points directly into the camera center, and all the predicted ray surface vectors using cosine similarity as the match. I'm not getting too much detail here because that's a little bit involved. So please check the paper and ask me any questions uh, if, you, if you want to know more about this. So, and then that's how you chose, you choose which is the closest ray surface that we assume that that's where the points being projected onto. And that's assumed to be the right match. And that's used for the view synthesis operation. That's how we are able to close the loop in this very complex and generic uh, camera model. Now, and also remember that at test time, we don't need uh, to project. You only need the lifting to produce the three different clouds. So this is actually a very uh, compact model for deployments, but not as much for training, but um, that allows us to go beyond pinhole and model essentially any central camera that we have available, given only training data. So there is no target based calibration or anything. And these are some examples of ray surface uh, learned from different camera geometries using the same architecture and starting weights. The only difference is the input data that is used for training which is from a pinhole camera on the left and a catheter to camera on the right. Uh, as we can see, the ray surface follows quite nicely the expected direction of each pixel's viewing ray. Uh, for a pinhole, we have this fan out pattern that is pointing outwards from, uh, as you move towards the edge of the image. And for uh, catheter optic, we have this rounder shape for, th for 360 degree perception. Uh, jointly with this ray surface, we also learn depth maps and that's also show on the bottom as well. So for B, for the catadopt camera, remember that the camera is actually pointing up and there is a mirror. So what you see here are the points that are where the camera is pointing at after it goes through the mirror. So it's actually abstracting away the mirror and pointing at what is supposed to point uh, by itself. So it doesn't really model the mirror. The mirror becomes part of the camera model uh, and this is all learned uh, from scratch based on the sequence of images just like those. Okay, here's some additional results for fisheye, again, for fisheye and also again, uh, get the optic cameras as well as the reconstructed point cloud for each image. The input image goes to the depth network, produce both the depth map and the ray surface. And these two predictions are used to lift, again, to lift to the information to 3D point clouds. And as you can see, the point class don't have the distortion artifacts present on the image because the ray surface accounts for this and position each, each pixel uh, in the correct 3D location, abstracting the, the camera model regardless of its nature. So it's learning to position 3D points in space as a byproduct of the self-supervised learning procedure. Uh, same thing on the right for the, for the catadoptic camera example, even though the image is highly distorted, 
the resulting point clouds are aligned, uh, as you can see on the ground and on the buildings, you see the walls are quite straight, um, which is what we are looking for if you want a proper 3D reconstru reconstruction of the environments. And another very interesting way to use our neural ray surfaces is for underwater scenes. And in this case, distortion are both in the camera itself, but also in the medium, because the water is moving and that changes the whole camera configuration from a distortion perspective. Uh, even in this case, we can recover quite sharp depth maps just from training on video sequences. And because we're also learning depth and eagle motion, we can accumulate point clouds over time as shown in the right here as we are trying to recreate the path taken by the robot as it moves underwater. And finally, I'll take a little bit, I'll talk a little bit about another work that we presented just last month as well in ICRA. It's called self supervised camera self calibration from video. As you saw earlier, uh, estimating camera geometry using perfect array surfaces works quite well. But because there is no clo closed form solution, uh, training tends to be slow and a little bit unstable. So that's something that can be done, but it's a little bit, little bit of a challenge to get the right uh, training schedule and things like this. And also because we are estimating per image and per pixel geometry, there is no true calibration because each image will have its own estimates. So I'm not sure if I, if I said that before, but for each image you're producing um, its own ray surface. There is no global camera, camera parameters being learned. In order to address these issues here, we're proposing to use instead a more generic, but still parametric camera model instead of the traditional pinhole model. And this led to, the, to our use of the unified camera model that introduces one additional parameter, alpha, on top of the four traditional pinhole parameters, focal length, principal points. And, and this alpha parameter models distortion. When alpha is zero, we have a pinhole camera, and the higher it gets up to one, the more distortion, the more distorted the image is. But it's still governed by the same camera model. We also moved away from per pixel and per image estimation towards per camera or per data set estimation. So instead of a network, we are learning a single uh, tensor containing all the um, calibration parameters of the camera. And, that, and this tensor is globally optimized across all the images from the same camera, from the same data set and so forth. Uh, this approach led to much more stable training while still keeping the flexibility of modern cameras with different geometries without any prior knowledge of the geometry itself. Also, the learn uh, parameter tensor can be used as camera, um, camera, <coughs> as camera calibration within the unified camera model framework. We show that these uh, parameters are precise and accurate by achieving sub-pixel reprojection error relative to the standard target base calibration methods. And also we can use those parameters to do rectification um, on, on the distorted images themselves. And again, because we, we require no ground truth, we can keep training those even after um, deployments because we can still keep training because we don't, we don't really require ground truth and just keep training those after the facts and account for uh, miss calibrations and any others of errors that could uh, arise after training that change the underlying camera geometry. And we can keep on training and uh, learning those as well. So we are constantly adapting to changes in the camera model itself. And finally, because we are learning per data set calibration, we can combine data from multiple sources and train everything together. So we can learn from multiple data sets with multiple camera models completely transparently, just by having one different learn tensor for each camera. And that's what the network is learning for each camera, it learns its own calibration tensor. And we show that this leads to improvement over training over each data set independently, because now we have more training data to work with. Uh, here are some examples, again, of the fisheye and the optic images, as always the predicted depth maps from our proposed uh, unified camera model self-supervised depth and eagle motion framework. Uh, because we can learn everything from scratch, we can apply the solution to any sequence of images and end up with uh, cool videos like this one on the right. So we just provide us with a, with a video and we can produce depth and motion and the actual camera model within the unified camera model framework uh, for you. 
And that's all I have for today. Thank you very much. Uh, if there are any questions, feel free to reach out to me. And we have code available for all of those models. So please, uh, if you want to check some of our open source repositories, they are over there. And thank you very much. Uh, any thoughts on challenges in extending your depth former model in multi-frame self-supervised depth with transformers to omnidirectional cameras? I don't think there is any uh, challenge that would prevent us from doing that. I think that's just a matter of trying to find ways to train those uh, jointly because everything that I talked about here only works at the loss setting. So that is only needed at training time, if we're working to the multi-frame self supervised setting, then you also need to estimate those at uh, uh, test time as well in order to produce the features and the weights for the neural network. So that becomes a little bit more challenge, but I think it's completely possible with enough research and some other novelties on top of what we have so far. Uh, thank you. Uh, next question is, is there any reason why this would or would not work with unrectified fisheye cameras? Would not work with? Uh, unrectified fisheye cameras. That is, no, I think I think that was created exactly for that. So we don't need to do any sort of pre-processing of the images themselves before applying that through the depth network. So we can work with raw images without any sort of pre-processing. I think we have more questions. But, uh, since we are yeah, no, yeah, I can just keep talking to, to people on Zoom and yeah, answering the questions. Can yes, and please talk to me. I'm going to be here all week, so please stop by and ask me questions. Okay, thank you. Now I would like to invite Professor Song Hang from MIT Boston. Uh, professor, uh, professor Song Hang is an associate professor at MIT's EECS department, and he received his PhD from Stanford University. His research focuses on efficient deep learning computing, and he has proposed deep compression technique that can reduce neural network size by an order of magnitude without losing accuracy and the hardware implementation efficient entrance engine that first exploited pruning and weight sparsity in deep learning accelerators. Uh, he would be giving us the talk on efficient deep learning on the edge and V fusion, multitask, multi-sensor fusion with unified bird's eye view representation. Hey, can I uh, enable uh, share screen? Hello, can you hear me? Share screen is currently disabled. Hello? Hello? Yeah, uh, we, we can hear you, yeah. Um... Hello, can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Could you enable share screen? You cannot share a screen while other participant is sharing. I, I, I need the permission to share the screen. Could you give me the permission to share the screen? 
can you try now? Uh, no, it works. Hey, hello everyone. Hey. Uh, my name is Song. Today I'm going to present ML in efficient deep learning, in particular for multi sensor fusion tasks. So nowadays, deep learning is coming to the edge. There are many uh, feedings of IoT devices, uh, like mobile phones. You can't, you can't see the screen, Prof. Can you see the are you, are you, your screen which you are sharing? Already shared my screen. Thanks. Are you able to see the screen? Oh, yeah, viewing your screen. Hold on. I think I can switch it here. Yeah. Uh, yeah, we can see. I Hello? Uh, yeah, we can see your screen. Okay. Um, so there are billions of IoT devices, but deep learning requires a lot of computation. So uh, we've been working on how to make neural networks more efficient, has less computation, and more hardware friendly. I uh, will first introduce some general techniques and then dive deeper into uh, the multi sensor fusion to fuse multiple cameras and LiDAR data for autonomous driving, which is one of the um, most important applications for efficient AI on edge devices. So pruning is a technique that can uh, drastically reduce the amount of computation for deep neural nets. And we find uh, deep neural nets are highly amiable to pruning where there is a lot of redundancy so that we can remove those redundant connections so that the model can become smaller. We can remove the redundant synapses, we prune those redundant neurons, and then by retraining and pruning iteratively, we can fully recover the accuracy of neural nets. And this pruning technique naturally happens in the human brain. So a newborn child has about 50 trillion synapses in the brain. When he grows to one year old, this number surges to a thousand trillion. But as he gets to adolescent, the number didn't increase, but decreased to about 500 trillion. So this pruning process naturally happens in the human brain. And how about for uh, artificial neural nets? And we observe the similar uh, observation. So this is AnexNet. When we prune those neural nets, we can, um, uh, by pruning and retraining, we can uh, recover the accuracy at roughly 80%. And if we iteratively do pruning and retraining, we can remove 90% of the connections without losing any accuracy on ImageNet for NXNet. So this paved the way for uh, accelerating neural networks with sparsity and pruning. And the second technique is by combining pruning with quantization. So we can use fewer number of bits to represent each weight. And by combining pruning and quantization, we can reduce resident 50 from 100 megabytes to only six megabytes, uh, which makes it, uh, makes it a lot easier to squeeze neural nets into mobile devices by reducing the binary size of the neural net. Pruning and the sparsity is not well supported in existing hardware. So um, we proposed several techniques to accelerate directly the sparse and compressed neural networks, including designing the specialized AC called EIE, Efficient Inference Engine, that takes the compressed deep neural network model and efficiently walks through the sparsity uh, data structure are using a uh, four bit virtual weight and decoded into a 16 bit real weight, and using six to four bit relative index and accumulate that into the uh, full uh, 16 bit absolute index and walk through the sparse matrix, uh, sparse vector multiplication to accelerate those FC layers. And then uh, we also propose the efficient speech recognition engine, uh, which is a FPG prototype of EIE to accelerate the sparse and compressed neural nets. And later we proposed uh, two accelerators. Uh, one is Spark, the general purpose uh, sparse matrix uh, metri uh, multiplication accelerator and the Spark Spaten, which means sparse attention to accelerate the sparse attention mechanism by dynamically remove those redundant tokens um, in those attention modules. And now sparsity support is uh, available in NVIDIA GPUs and also Xilinx Vitus AI provide those tools to compress neural nets. And it's getting uh, a lot of attention in recent years 
uh, becoming a very popular technique if you search network pruning as a fundamental technique to make neural nets more efficient for mobile devices. And later, we propose a couple of techniques to automatically uh, do the pruning, quantization, and neural architecture search. So rather than relying on a lot of human efforts, we propose the AMC, AMC the AutoML technique for model compression, so that we can squeeze neural nets to find the optimal sparsity and redundancy each layer and automatically make it smaller without a lot of human bandwidth. And then uh, we propose the pro proxy-based neural architecture search to learn not only those weight parameters, but also those architectural parameters so that we can uh, make neural nets uh, more efficient by selecting uh, the model architecture while we are learning. This is integrated by PyTorch and out of Bloom. These are also available in the PyTorch hub. Uh, we also propose HAQ, hardware-aware automated quantization to support uh, for uh, the mixed precision inference hardware um, to automatically find the optimal uh, weight and uh, activation precision for each layer. Uh, later, we proposed the uh, once for all architecture. So rather than compressing existing models, we want to invent new models that are efficient to begin with. And then rather than taking a lot of time to train and evaluate the accuracy, we propose to train a network called the once for all model. Uh, different parts of the model is sparsely activated, and then we can select the different subnetworks to directly get the accuracy and latency without any retraining. So we can select the best networks without any retraining, uh, making the neural architecture search process very efficient by relying on this once for all network. So in this model, it can contain 10 to the 19 different subnetworks. So we can train a lot of neural networks at the same time. Um, and then we can select different subnetworks. Different so each subnetwork can operate independently without interfering with each other. And as a result, we uh, we measured the latency accuracy trade-off on diverse hardware platforms, including the Samsung uh, phone, Google phone, LG phone, NVIDIA GPU, Intel CPU, and Xilinx FPGAs. On the GPU, we can reduce the latency from 28 milliseconds to only 12 milliseconds with even better accuracy. So we applied OFA to multiple on-device AI tasks. This is like um, pose estimation uh, deployed on Qualcomm Snapdragon 855. We can reduce the latency by 4.9 times. And a couple of more applications uh, we are using OFA um, on Qualcomm device and also on Raspberry Pis so that can, everything can be performed in real time for person car uh, detection for gaze estimation. Uh, which could be used for driver, uh, driver monitoring system and also on device segmentation. Uh, and most recently, we've been working on uh, applying OFA for GANs. So uh, those GAN models require pixel-wise prediction, which is very computationally heavy. We are trying a, a once for all GAN and then deploy different subnets for different scenarios. So we can do photo editing much quicker than before. So in the baseline model, uh, each editing, like make the lady look younger, takes about three seconds. This is due to uh, the GAN models require pixel-wise prediction, which is very computationally heavy. And then we applied uh, this uh, once for all to, the, uh, to design these GAN models. We call it any cost GAN, since we can select different subnetworks um, to do the inference. So now it becomes much faster, uh, almost real time to make the lady smile. It takes only 0 0.38 seconds now on a laptop. And also we can slide the bar to make her look younger, enable this uh, interactive photo editing on this um, laptop edge devices. And this work is fully open source. Uh, welcome to check out oifa.mit.edu. Uh, for this once for all work, we offer several code and tutorials how to use, and we also released a 50 plus uh, once for all pre trained models to fit different latency and hardware constraints. Okay, let's now switch gear to talk about a very important edge AI application, which is automotive applications. So there are multiple cameras, multiple sensors, multiple uh, radar and lidars on the car, and how do we efficiently fuse? Uh, different sensors and perform different tasks, including detection, segmentation, bird-eye view segmentation, etc. Okay. 
Uh, so the background is that um, there are multiple sensors in the in the car, including the ca cameras, gliders, and radars. Um, they have advantages and disadvantages in different scenarios. Like cameras are not good at uh, in the low light condition; everything is dark, you cannot see much stuff. And lidar is not good at rainy conditions due to the uh, reflection. And also, there is heavy computational challenges for efficient sensor fusion. For example, the LiDAR and the 3D point clouds, they are highly sparse, um, highly irregular, and require a large amount of memory footprint to process. Uh, and camera and 2D images on the other, on the other hand side require multiple, uh, much higher resolution than those mobile phones, okay? And we have multiple cameras to process that require real-time processing, which makes it very computationally hungry. And also we need to process multiple sensors okay, to perform multiple tasks, um, including detection and, and segmentation. Um, that's, make, that's making it even more computationally hungry. So we've done uh, a lot of algorithm software and hardware code design to efficiently accelerate these automotive applications and sensor fusion. So for example, on the algorithm side, uh, we worked on uh, PBCN, point voxel CN, uh, to deal with the scarcity for, uh, for the point cloud, okay? Provided a new design space to combine uh, the point-based uh, feature transformation, which is fine-grained, um, and also the voxel-based feature, feature aggregation, which is more coarse-grained. Uh, to reduce the sparsity and e enable better regularity, which is more hardware friendly. On top of this new primitive on point cloud, we further proposed uh, SPV NAS, which is a new architecture search for point cloud. Uh, basically, we can find the optimal uh, depths and width for uh, different layers. To accelerate the uh, sparse point cloud inference, uh, we propose a Torch Sparse, which is open source GPU library for 3D sparse convolution. And the basic idea is to group the computation together to renew, remove, reduce the amount of kernel calls while adding redundancy to, to pad uh, the, uh, uh, the low density uh, computation kernels with high density computation kernels to trade computation for regularity. And finally, we propose a customized hardware accelerator called a point ACC uh, to accelerate the sparse point cloud um, uh, inference. So apart from such computational challenge, another uh, algorithm, uh, algorithmic challenge is that to fuse the feature maps from different sensors like multi-view camera and LiDAR, the challenge is that different features can exist in different views. For example, the camera features are in the per perspective view, while the LiDAR and the, and the radar features are typically in the 3D view, okay? So even for the cameras, they are of different locations, okay? They are, we have front camera in the back and also in the left and also on the right, there are six to eight or even 10 cameras in the car, okay? So such view discrepancy makes the feature fusion much more difficult since the same element in each tensor, they might correspond to drastically different locations in the real world, okay? So we cannot just naively concatenate those features. Another way is to do the late sensor fusion. In Tesla, they have a demo showing that uh, late fusion is not optimal and we need an earlier fusion uh, while we are doing the feature extraction. Okay, so it is very crucial to share to find a shared space to share a shared representation so that all the sensor features can be easily converted into this 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 space without losing uh, without information loss. Okay, and also that this space should be suitable for different types of tasks, including segmentation and also detection. So the first solution. Um, is to fuse, to project the LiDAR point cloud to the camera plane, okay? To use the camera plane as the shared feature space and render um, the uh, 2.5D uh, sparse step, okay? So the camera becomes, is augmented with the depth information. 
However, such conversion is geometrically lossy. Two neighbors on the depth map, they can be very far away from each other in the 3D space. Okay? So this makes the camera view less effective for tasks that focus on the object and scene geometry, especially the 3D object detection. Um, more popular uh, state-of-the-art sensor fusion method uh, decorate the uh, LiDAR points um, with their corresponding camera features or the semantic labels or CNN features or virtual points. So such um, decoration is effective, but the LiDAR point cloud is very sparse. Okay, It is semantically lossy. So the camera and the LiDAR features have drastically different densities, okay? uh, resulting in only less than 5% of the camera features are actually matched to the LiDAR point cloud for a 32-channel LiDAR scanner. So giving up the semantic density of camera features severely hurts the model's performance on those semantic-oriented tasks, such as the BEV map segmentation. And similar drawbacks also apply to more recent fusion methods in the latent space. So our solution is to use the bird eye view as the unified representation for sensor fusion. Okay, so for the um, camera and also the lidar, we convert uh, both of them into the BEV features, uh, features, and then uh, fuse them in the BEV space. This view is friendly to almost all perception tasks since the output space is also in the bird eye view. And more importantly, the transformation to uh, bird eye view keeps both the geometric structure from the LiDAR features and also the semantic density from the camera features. On the other hand, uh, the LiDAR to BEV projection flattens the sparse LiDAR features along the height dimension, assuming uh, a car cannot lay on top of another car. So it doesn't uh, create any geometric distortion. And the final feature map is dense, which is hardware friendly to process. On the other hand, uh, the camera to BV projection casts each camera feature pixel back into a ray in the 3D space, which can result in a dense BV feature map in figure 1C that retains the full semantic information uh, from the cameras so that we can preserve as much as the information uh, and possibly remove the redundant connection, uh, redundant processing. Okay, so this is the high level view of the um, multi-task, multi-sensor fusion. So given different sensory inputs, the RGB images on the top and LiDAR point cloud on the bottom, we first apply a modality-specific modality encoders to extract their features. And then we transform those multi-model features in a unified BEV representation that preserves both the geometric and the semantic information. And then we identify the efficiency bottleneck of the real transformation and accelerate the BEV pooling with pre-computation and interval reduction. So with all the sens sensor features converted to BEV representation, we can easily fuse them together with element-wise concatenation. Okay, so though in the same space, the LiDAR BEV feature and camera BEV feature can still be uh, spatially misaligned to some extent due to the inaccurate depth prediction. So we apply a convolution-based BEV encoder with a few res residual blocks to compensate for such local misalignments. So uh, the critical part is the camera to BEV transformation. Okay, so following the LSS, we explicitly predict the discrete depth distribution of each pixel, and then we scatter each feature pixel in the D in the D discrete points along the camera ray, and rescale the associated features by their corresponding depth probabilities, similar as LSS. So this generates basically a point cloud from the camera features. Uh, the dimension is N, H, W, and D, where N is the number of cameras, H and W is the camera feature map size. 
And such a 3D feature uh, point cloud is quantized along the XY axis with a step size of 0.4 meters. And then we use the BEV pooling operation to aggregate all the features uh, within each R by R BEV grid and flatten the features along the Z axis. Actually, this method is quite slow. It's surprisingly inefficient slow. So it's taking more than 500 milliseconds on the RTX 3090 GPU, while the rest of the model is only taking around 100 milliseconds. So this is because the camera feature point cloud is very large. Uh, there could be around 2 million points generated for each frame, which is two orders of magnitude denser than a LiDAR feature point cloud. To lift this bottleneck, uh, we propose uh, to optimize the BEV pooling with pre-computation and interval reduction. So the first step of BEV pooling is to associate each point in the camera feature point cloud with a BEV grid. So for different from LiDAR point clouds, the coordinates for the camera feature point are fixed as long as the camera intrinsics and extrinsics are the same, okay, which is usually the case with proper uh, calibration. So motivated by that, we can pre-compute the 3D coordinates and BV grid index for each point. And we also sort all the points according to the grid indices and recall the rank of each point. During inference, we only need to uh, reorder all the feature points based on the pre-computed tasks. This reduces the latency from 17 milliseconds to four milliseconds. Another acceleration uh, technique is by um, the efficient BEV pooling. So existing uh, implementation first compute the prefix sum of all the points and then subtract the value at the boundaries where the indices change. So the prefix sum operation require a tree reduction on the GPU and produces many unused partial sums. Both of them are inefficient. To accelerate such uh, feature aggregation, we propose a new specialized GPU kernel to parallelize directly over the BV grids. And this reduced the latency of feature aggregation from 500 milliseconds to only uh, two milliseconds. So in the end, the camera to BV transformation is 40 times faster with our optimized BV pooling. And the latency is reduced from 500 milliseconds to only uh, 12 milliseconds. And now we evaluate BV fusion for camera LiDAR fusion on 3D object detection and BV map segmentation, covering both the geometric and semantic oriented tasks. So, uh, uh, so quantitatively, um, BV fusion achieves the state of the art result, ranking first on the new scene um, benchmark. So it, it is running 8.4 frames per second on a desktop GPU. Uh, compared with transfusion, BV fusion achieves 1.3% improvement and uh, reduced the max by 1.9 times and reduced the late measured latency by 1.3 times. So another example is on the uh, BV map segmentation task. This is a um, semantic oriented task. Okay. As a result, those camera only and BV, uh, BV future model outperforms the LiDAR only model baselines by eight to 13%. Okay. Um, so this, this observation is exact the opposite result in table one, where state of the art camera only 3D detectors got outperformed by LiDAR only detectors by almost 20 MAPs. And our camera only model boosts the performance of existing monocular BEV map segmentation methods by at least 12%. And let's check out the different weather conditions. Okay, so rainy conditions and dry conditions. A camera for the LiDAR, it is not good at those rainy conditions. So Detecting objects in rainy weather is very challenging for LiDAR only models okay, due to the significant sensor noises. And thanks to the robustness of camera sensors as, as under different weathers, BV fusion can improve uh, center point by 
as AP, closing the performance gap between um, the different uh, weather conditions. So this is showing a demo. Uh, this is first showing the LiDAR only baseline. The segmentation result is pretty poor using the LiDAR only baseline, uh, 59 MAP. TV fusion improved that to 69 MAP. And now both the detection and segmentation is much more robust under such a uh, rainy condition. Let's uh, then analyze uh, different lighting conditions. So camera suffers from low light and overexposure. Um, therefore, the nighttime um, performance, segmentation performance is much lower than the daytime. And using the uh, DV fusion, we can uh, boost the MOU by 12.8, uh, which is significant compared with the baseline model. And here we have a visualization. The camera only baseline achieves only 35 MAP for detection, 30 MLU for segmentation. Lots of the vehicles are having a false negative. But using BEV fusion, we improve MAP to uh, from 35 to 42. Okay, and MLU also improved to 40 to 43. Now we can detect uh, the objects with much less false positives. BEV fusion is also efficient. Um, for example, the baseline model MMAP runs 5.3 FPS on uh, RTX 3090, while uh, BEV fusion can perform 8.4 frames per second on the same GPU. And we also analyze the performance under different object sizes and distances. Okay, on figure A, uh, BV fusion achieves consistent improvement over the LiDAR only counterpart. Okay, for both small and large objects. Well, MAP has only negligible improvements for objects larger than four meters. Okay, so especially for these far distance objects, which are safety critical, the improvement of BV fusion is pretty significant. Uh, for those, uh, sorry, those for those small objects. The improvement is very significant. And for those far objects, uh, the improvement is also very significant using different uh, using BV fusion. And on the right hand side is for different uh, LiDAR sparsity. As we are going down uh, with a uh, last number of beams, the improvement of uh, BV fusion is quite significant, significant compared with the baseline. So this is a full ablation study um, to learn about different modalities to select the voxel size, select the image size, uh, appearance size, data augmentation methods, and image different image backbones. Just show some of the um, uh, insights why we are choosing, um, for example, why we are choosing this voxel size, this particular image size, uh, this particular input size, and both. Um, augmenting both the LiDAR and the image, and also using switch zooming transformer as the image backbone. And this, uh, if you're interested, feel free to check out the bvfusion.mit.edu. We also uh, released the code for inference on our GitHub. And thanks to NSF, Kendai, Qualcomm, NVIDIA, and Apple for supporting our work. And take home is that the BV space is a very uh, attractive modality for us to do uh, early sensor fusion and BEV fusion provides provides an effective yet accelerated methods to uh, to get not only a uh, top one on the leaderboard but also be able to greatly accelerate uh, the inference due to um, it's selecting the right space to fuse those features that's all for my presentation thank you for the attention Uh, since we are running since we are running a bit late i'll just uh, have one question for the pro uh, can sparse lidar be used to guide the camera to bv transformation to speed up computation and also to improve accuracy uh, so we already have the sparse lidar helping the helping the camera so that's all the meat of this presentation 
So here on the bottom, we are using the sparse LiDAR to guide the camera, and especially on the night, night view. So for example, um, this is a night view. This is the camera only baseline, lots of mispredictions. The, and also the um, DV segmentation result is very poor. But with the guidance of LiDAR, the detection result becomes much better, improving the MAP from previously it was 35, now it's 40, 42. Yeah, just to clarify, the question was mainly to mainly the part where the camera features are transformed to BEV features. So can the LiDAR help there too? Because there's a depth ambiguity, right? Oh, for the transformation here, we didn't uh, rely on the assistance of LiDAR. So we are following the LSS to predict the probability of lifting from the 2D space into 3D space. And there are also discussion whether such probabilistic uh, lifting is essential. And some research is showing that even uniform uh, uh, lifting is, is also a good way to uh, do the projection and it is more computationally efficient. So here we didn't rely on the LiDAR to assist the projection from the uh, camera camera view to the BEV, uh, to the 3D view. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Oh, thank you, Prof. The whole model is trained end to end. Uh, there might be some information flow um, from this projection since those, those uh, probabilities are trained end to end. Thank you, Prof, for your presentation. Uh, now I would like to invite Professor. Now I would like to invite Professor Yasutaka Furukawa from Simon Fraser University. Uh, from Canada, he's an associate professor of computing science at Simon Fraser University. Prior to SFU, he was an assistant professor at Washington University. He completed his PhD from Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, and today he would be talking about extreme panoramic indoor reconstruction. Is it a mute of the speaker? Yes. All right. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and also for inviting me for a talk. It's my great pleasure. I hope it's working. So uh, I'm Yasser Furukawa from Simon Fraser University. Uh, today, I want to take you to the world of extreme panoramic indoor modeling. So consumer grade panorama camera is exploding. And just pushing a model, you can get a very good panorama image. And especially in real estate, for uh, example, location is exploding. So this is a demo video from the Rico, the company who has the Rico Tira series. So Rico alone has collected 100 million panoramas for the real estate service alone, which has the house tours for more than 30 million houses. And mostly in Japan, also in many other countries. So the adoption rate is extreme. And also are some other notable companies for indoor scanning modeling, also looking into the consumer grade uh, device for the indoor mapping. So this is a sample uh, virtual house tour from the Rico production pipeline. It's a very nice panorama, but they are not connected. It's just a slideshow panel to the next panel. And the issue is it is very difficult to estimate the camera pose, align them. So the issues are, these are images which say the house wanna goes in, take pictures of a house to show to the clients. They don't care about SFM or they don't care about floor plan, uh, just photos show to customers. So uh, there are no really overlaps between panels and many rooms have no panels collected actually even. So if you want to have a better virtual tours where panels are connected or maybe use that for floor plan reconstruction 
for better price predictions or maybe checking building codes. We need a new technology to utilize all these images. So looking back the golden standard, how you do image-based reconstruction, we have two steps, SFM and uh, dense reconstruction or multi-view stereo. So you get SFM to get the camera pose with the sun sparse point cloud as a byproduct. Then perform a reconstruction to get higher quality geometry. But I am looking into extreme setting, like extreme image-based reconstruction. So our setting is like this. So images, the input, are a set of panels, and one panel per room, and many rooms have no panels. Then we have to do some kind of extreme SFM to get the camera pose, and then extreme reconstruction to recover a floor plan. So these are extreme because there are really no overlaps in the input panels. We have to estimate the camera poses, and then some rooms have no panels, but we have to still recover the floor plan. That's the why it's called extreme. And our group uh, had uh, two approaches to tackle these two problems, which I'll talk about uh, today. So first, uh, I go for the extreme SFM piece. So this is a joint work with a RICO, uh, and main task was done by Amin Shabani, my student, and it was presented at ICCV last year. And the third author, Makoto Odamaki-san, he's from RICO. He's the father, mother of Rico Theta series. So without him, maybe there's no consumer panorama revolution we are seeing right now. So let me first give you the task of extreme panoramic indoor SFM. Input is again, a set of panels and the task is to estimate the panorama camera parameters, which is very hard. So take a look and trying to guess the camera pose, which is very hard. And here are the kind of answers. Uh, so the Enrico system, you have to use a tripod, a monopod to take a panel, meaning the height is fixed. So you don't have to estimate Z. So X, Y, Z, you just have to get X, Y. For the rotation, the IMU can give you the gravity or you do vanishing point deduction for vertical direction, which is very robust. So for rotation, you only get the your angle, heading angle. So only three parameters per panel, as opposed to six for normal camera. And we, we don't care about the intrinsics. We assume that's given at the factory. So three parameters per panel. So let's look at the existing techniques which could potentially solve this very, really hard problem. So the classical SFM needs dense image coverage, many images with rich overlap. So uh, can't work. And DNN-based feature matcher can enable sparse view settings, but still need lots of overlaps. Uh, cannot work for the task. And there exists a region of extreme pose estimation more recently. Uh, so for example, Young et al. Uh, proposed to hallucinate uh, room structure, entire room structure, given a single image. And another image, again, hallucinate entire room structure. By matching hallucinated room structure, they estimate the camera pose, relative pose. And also some other techniques. So there's a family of techniques which utilize the prior on a single room shape. So meaning, when they estimate the camera pose, the final room shape must be something standard. That's a prior uh, they are uh, using. And our technique is uh, different. We are using learning the prior the arrangement of rooms in a single house. And that's the difference. Uh, with the lack of time, I just give you a high level view of the system. Uh, details are in the paper. So again, input is set of panels. And we use uh, off-the-shelf uh, toolboxes, such as Horizon Net for getting the room layout, or the detection network for getting the doors and windows detected. And since we assume the camera height is constant, a room layout estimation can be converted into the room shape from top-down view. And also doors and window detection can be mapped to a line segment here and here. And as you can see, we are assuming my hat the world here. Uh, now, uh, we have to, we have three room shapes. We have to put them together, arrange it. So this is more like a Tetris, uh, for rotation because Manhattan fourfold ambiguity, like a Tetris. So you have to rotate a piece and attach to another piece by aligning door to door, pick another one, rotate four ways, attach it door to door. So we exhaustively enumerate all possible ways of combining three rooms, which is actually exponential in the number of rooms. They make all the arrangement candidates. And this is the heuristics. 
then use component to this learning part, evaluate how good the arrangement is. So you have to evaluate many, many times and rank them uh, from the most likely arrangement to the least likely arrangement. Uh, for the experiments, we had about 300 houses, uh, 1,000 panoramas, and the database has annotations of the room layout under Manhattan assumption, door window directions, room types, and the camera poses. So here is a sample uh, reconstruction or pose estimation result. Again, the top row is the input. These are the input you have to estimate camera pose. And the right is the GT, ground truth. And here are the top five results. So again, we enumerate like a thousand possible arrangements and rank it by the CNN score, the top five. So there's no single the exact answer, but maybe these are close. The orientation of this room is off, but I guess fairly good. Do I see a mouse cursor? Oh, actually, maybe no. Uh, so if you look at the uh, number five, uh, that is almost good, except the top right room, whose rotation is off a little bit. Mm -hmm. And again, given top, uh, imagine you have to solve this task yourself, which is very difficult. In this case, uh, again, number five is actually correct, very correct. Uh, there's some gap in the middle, but these are the closets. Uh, in this case, top five uh, has a very good answer. So let me give you some numbers uh, to give a sense of how good this thing is working. Uh, so this graph shows a performance on our method red line and some baselines, but just look at the red curve for now. So this graph, uh, so if you look at this point, this basically says in 75% of the cases or 75% of the test cases, top three results have the successful reconstruction. And here successful meaning rotation is correct. And then panorama is within one meter from the GT. Uh, so again, if one of the top three results contains a good solution and good solution is rotation is correct. And the uh, position is within one meter from GT for every panel. Uh, and uh, if you have top five, yes, maybe 80% of the cases, there's a good solution in top five. If you tighten the, uh, the position threshold to 0 0.6 meter, 0 0.2 meter, obviously things go down like this. And if you use the standard SFM uh, method, it is zero, meaning it's, it's really zero. They couldn't match any panels, no, uh, no result. Uh, this is done by the open MVG, uh, made by PL, uh, one of the co-organizers of the workshop. It's very good software, but too difficult for any method to do. So that's the first piece. Uh, let me go to the floor plan reconstruction, the second half. Uh, this is done by my uh, student, Asetid. Again, I'll start by introducing the task of extreme floor plan reconstruction. So we got, again, four panels in using the extreme SFM, our previous pipeline, to estimate camera poses. And we also got the room shape. So these are the inputs to our the second pipeline. Now we have to recover this thing, the ground truth floor plan. So the challenges are there are many things missing in the input because people don't go to every single room to take a picture. So we have to recover a certain closet missing and balcony missing, closet missing. So we have to recover uh, missing stuff, doors, uh, sorry, missing doors and missing rooms. That's the target. I want to define two terminologies here. The first, uh, direct missing rooms. So these are the rooms which are missing in the input, but are directly connected to the input, one of the four rooms. So kind of easier rooms to infer. Then there are indirect uh, missing rooms, which are very hard one. So say this closet right here, this closet is connected to this room, which is also missing. So you have to like follow two links to get to the input room. And also this door is very difficult because this door is between balcony and uh, bedroom, but none of the two rooms are actually visible in the input. So this is very hard to recover. So let's again look at the existing literature which, which could solve this task. So content hallucination could be one related to field, uh, maybe dating back to imaging painting, their famous works, uh, which is actually also pretty amazing. And uh, with deep learning imaging painting at the left gets more powerful or inferring the entire panorama from a single perspective image in the context of illumination inference was also done by deep learning. 
or as you know, from a single image to the entire 3D shape, including invisible surfaces, is it possible? Or oops, estimating the appearance of a house given floor plan. So there are many kind of content hallucination tasks, thanks to the powerful uh, learning techniques. But one difference is for most of these techniques are raster data hallucination, meaning uh, images, pixel array, or the dense mesh model. And we care about the structured geometry floor plan. It's a vector geometry. So there are some other differences. So I'd like a little bit go into technical to explain our pipeline here. Uh, so suppose we have two panels to be simple, two panoramas input, and again, poses are given by the extreme SFM pipeline earlier. And this is the output. Uh, so again, two yellow things are the input rooms. There are some missing direct rooms, blue ones. And it's like an easy one maybe to guess. Then there's a green one, which is indirect uh, missing room, which is harder. And then the purple or pink, which is indirect missing door, which is even harder to guess. So you're given yellow and you have to go after a, a blue and the green and the pink. Uh, that's a task. So we represent these two rooms as two images. Uh, so this image is one room and one channel for the binary segmentation master is actually the, the class label. So the segmentation mask, a semantic segmentation mask for the room, another channel for the door location. So kind of typical semantic segmentation mask to represent a raster and another room for the same thing. So we use normal component to shrink the dimension, say uh, to two by two by D. So you can think of uh, this is a four D dimensional feature vectors. Again, compressing to two by two by D. So four feature vectors. So we do that to get for feature vector here. Uh, I've got no mass crystal. Uh, so for the one room, we get the four feature vector. Second room, I get the feature vector. Then with the max cooling uh, per location, and we get four feature vector here. So these four feature vector kind of knows the current input room information in short. Then we do the self-attention is a transformer, self-attention block to enrich it. In our experiments, we added another uh, similar thing, CNN branch only door in the semantic segmentation image or only room that improve but shouldn't really improve. Uh, maybe lack of data, some engineering issue, but these not, shouldn't be critical. But I'm putting it here because that's what we did. So uh, we got the self-attention and the orange, uh, the nose contain the input information. So the first transformer branch, trying to get the easy direct blue rooms, blue missing rooms. So starting from the white node, the learnable embedding, this is the typical dummy node, say in DTL architecture, uh, kind of empty node with learnable embedding. And then we do cross attention to feed orange information into the white one. So eventually white node becomes each missing blue room. So at the end, we put the component decoder to each node that gives you the binary segmentation mask for each room. So here there are three rooms. So each node gives you the segmentation mask for one room. Overlay together, we get the, the shape. So we can repeat the cross attention by fitting in orange information, self attention repeat. So we can get the kind of blue, uh, blue rooms recovered. And uh, we have actually another branch, again, transformer. This one is after the green indirect room. So intuitively, once you get blue, it's easier to go after green. So we have another like a transformer block. Again, the white node, dummy node will be learnable embedding, but the position encoding to distinguish the blue and green, a kind of typical encoding thing. Then a second branch goes after the green rooms. So here I say there are three green nodes, but there's only one, the green room. So two nodes should give you an empty mask. Only one should give you something. Uh, so again, we have a cross attention and the self attention. The lastly, we go after the missing door. Uh, again, if you have green and blue, the pink door is easier to guess. So we have again, the third cascade uh, going after the missing door, uh, the segmentation mask. So the output is raster format. We do some post-processing to make it exact vector format, like a real floor plan. It's a bit technical, but I hope you get the feeling of how things are working. And this cascading was critical actually to get the very good results. If you do everything in one shot, uh, it didn't work out very well. So we expanded our database uh, to 700 houses, 2,300 panels and adding the floor plan annotations. 
and run the experiments. So uh, again, left is the input, the raw input. And then extreme SFM gave me uh, the input partial reconstruction. So together are the input to the second pipeline. And the ground truth is at the top right, that's the answer. And uh, we want to compare against some baseline. So uh, we use the detection network as a baseline method. So the convenient king, a convenient uh, king of detection is mask RCNN. And transformer detection is about DTR. So these are two methods. So this detection task is like weird. So say, given this image, you have to say, oh, there's a room here. You have to fire this detection target. So it's like there's no signal, but you have to fire the room here, do detection. So it's kind of a detection where there's nothing. Um, actually, it works reasonably well, uh, MASCAR, CNN, and DETR. So here are the comparisons. Uh, the right is ours, and the MASCAR, CNN, and the DETL are in the middle. Uh, so you, you can see ours are really close to GT. And you may be surprised, especially top left part. There are three rooms missing, the colors of like purple, uh, uh, dark uh, black. These are very typical in Japanese houses. So when you enter either right or left, it's bathroom, shower room, and restroom, like three in a row, a lot. So knowing that is actually not bad. So uh, this is maybe surprising to you, but for us, we, we kind of know this should happen with a transformer. This is a kind of thing transformer is very good at, like a part by part memorization. And here's a much harder task, only three panels as input, then you have to infer like uh, maybe six missing rooms and five missing doors, super hard. Uh, and Masker CNN is horrible. Uh, DTL actually does fairly well. Uh, and ours are of course better. Uh, maybe there are certain places, just the number of closets and things are missing, but this is really hard. So I guess understandable. And this is the easier case, five panels as input. And uh, ours is again the best, maybe the size of the balcony, the left cyan color, the room, that's a balcony. It's a bit longer, but they're pretty reasonable uh, in our case. So again, I want to give you some number. Uh, so we use precision recall to evaluate the performance. This is pretty standard for the structural reconstruction literature. So say uh, my system produces <coughs> four missing rooms. So here we do not look into the existing input rooms, only missing rooms we recover. Against missing rooms in GT, that's how we compare. So four missing rooms recovered by our, by our method, there are three GT. So we can simply check IOU to see which one matches. So say the blue and orange matches. So in this case, we say precision is 50% because we have four rooms produced, but two are correct. So precision is 50. And recall is 66.7 because uh, there are three GT rooms, two are covered. So uh, we compare precision recall and compare against the mask RCNN versus DETL versus ours. And uh, there's a big gap within the two methods. And we have also a score for door. A door is very small, like a two pixel. So uh, IOU score tends to be very bad. So if you door you off by one pixel, you more like a mistake. That's why the score is very low. But still, this is far from satisfactory. Christian recalls are below 50, meaning it's useless in practice. Still a very long way to go. So uh, to conclude, uh, we are seeing the new type of indoor photography coming up. Uh, panorama images for real estate cases are very sparse. And uh, we talked about two tasks, new, new tasks, how to utilize these new types of imagery for something useful and propose two methods. So on going forward, what's the kind of the, my take home message or the key summary? So task is too extreme. It's too extreme to do anything useful at the production level, in my view. So the first way is to how do you design a post-processing task by human to make it usable? So this work is all about how to reduce the amount of human work to make it usable. That's the, the right way to go. And if you are OK, say Rico is OK abandoning 100 billion panoramas and 30 million houses. But they won't abandon. Uh, maybe they can have a new instruction to take panoramas in a new way. 
But again, uh, those people don't care about floor plans, SFM. It's very difficult to control how they take images. So it can be complicated, something very smart and easy, a small amount of information, then somehow you can make the system more robust. That's more like a challenge to me. All right, so I'd like to thank my funding agency and uh, that's all. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Uh, is there any Hello. Uh, uh, you mentioned that most houses uh, you're using a data set come from Japan. Uh, and we understand this is an extremely hard problem because it's extremely for, uh, especially for some rooms which are not directly linked to the, uh, the data play rooms. So I'm curious how well it will generalize to other houses uh, over the world. Uh, it will not. It will not be fail. So if you want to run USA, you have to get, get data from USA. <laughs> That's certain. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Uh, you know. Since we are running late, other people can just uh, post it on Zoom link and or get back to it. Yeah, thank you. We will take a short break of five minutes and everyone can.
Yes. Some reason my microphone had some issues today. I don't know why. Uh, hello everyone, uh, we would be starting back with our author presentations. Uh, uh, the author talks are nine minutes in general for the talk and one minute or two minutes for the questions. Uh, the first presenter is Radhka Tezor from Intel Corp and she will be presenting a new non-central model for fisheye calibration. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Rasta Tizor, I'm a graduate in Intel Lab, and uh, I'll describe the new non-central model for fisheye calibration that we have developed uh, with my colleagues. Uh, so
uh, that image point. Uh, that 3D point is specified by its Z distance and Z distance is expressed as the polynomial of Orr's order uh, with the linear term missing. Uh, unfortunately, we were not able to achieve the desired accuracy with this model, so we started modifying it. And first, we started with modifications of the central model. Uh, one of the affine parameters is actually redundant, so uh, it can be eliminated by camera coordinate system rotation. So we removed that parameter. And instead, we introduced two optional projective parameters, uh, since uh, projective transform seems to be a more accurate model for a sensor that's slightly tilted with respect to the optical axis of the lens. We also modified the distortion polynomial, because if you think about a fisheye lens that's constructed from spherical uh, elements, uh, that function actually should be smooth, even function. So besides of the linear term, we removed all the odd order terms. And we found also that, that using polynomials of higher order than four is, is helpful. Uh, but even with these improvements, it still wasn't enough. And the reason for that is that the central projection simply does not uh, accurately reflect what's, what's happening in practice with the fish islands. Over here, you can see a ray trace through um, the actual lens design of the Nikkor 16 millimeter fish islands. And you can see that the apparent viewpoint actually tends to shift forward as the incident angle increases. And uh, that shift is actually quite significant. It's over one centimeter uh, between zero and 90 degree uh, incident angle, which if you are working with objects that are close to the camera and high resolution camera translates into tens of pixels of, of an error. Yeah, so it's, it's quite a lot. So we fix this uh, by adding uh, another polynomial to the model that uh, actually models this amount of, of the viewpoint shift. It's also an even polynomial, so it has only even terms. And uh, the constant term is 0, because that's where we put the origin of the coordinate system. Uh, the special thing, or what was different about this model when you compare it to some other non-central models, is that we model uh, the amount of the viewpoint shift, not as the function of the incident angle, but as the function of the radius and the image plane. And that allows merging it seamlessly into Scaramuza's model. Uh, so apart from having to evaluate two polynomials instead of one, uh, the mappings from 2D to 3D and 3D to 2D have pretty much the same complexity as, as uh, with the original uh, center model, there's no need to first solve about the new projection center. Uh, the calibration algorithm is more or less standard. We use a modified version of Scaramuza's initialization algorithm. Uh, you can find the details uh, in the paper. And then it's followed by nonlinear refinement, uh, the traditional minimization of uh, the total square projection error works fine. Um, however, if speed is of essence, it's better to use a cost function that uses spatial points, so as you don't need the projections from 3D to 2D. Yeah, and instead, you can go from 2D to 3D. Uh, we ran experiments with both synthetic and uh, real life data. So this is from synthetic experiment with that lens design of the Nikkor uh, 16 millimeter lens. Uh, you can see uh, in the graph on the right how the calibrated distortion compares to the ground truth. The red curves uh, are the original MATLAB model. The blue curves are uh, the improved central model. Uh, in green, we have the non-central model that we developed and ground truth is in black. Uh, we have there both, uh, uh, we have dashed curve and solid curve. That's because we ran also comparison 
between calibrating with traditional uh, checkerboard chart images where the whole chart needs to be in within the field of view for the image to be used. And that's in the dash. And when we allowed images of the chart to be only partially visible, uh, that helps to increase the proportion of points that are in the outer areas of the field of view and increases the accuracy of calibration for those regions. And finally, we ran experiments with our fisheye array uh, with the 16 cameras. Uh, there, in the absence of ground truth for the calibration, we use a simple computer vision experiment where we take pairs of points uh, from the neighboring cameras. Uh, we triangulate the 3D position and project back to other cameras and compare to actual detected points. Uh, you can see that with the original MATLAB model, uh, the average error on over 80,000 estimates that, that we had was about 2.8 pixels, but uh, about 11% of the estimates were actually more than five pixels off. Yeah, with uh, improved central model, we were not able to improve this accuracy below average of two pixels uh, with our improved uh, non-central model uh, we go down to about half a pixel and you can see that only 0.17% of the estimates were actually more than five pixels off. Yeah, so that's quite significant improvement in the accuracy. Well, that's all that I wanted to show here. So if you have any questions, I would be happy to answer them. Just a quick question. Did you see much variation between the cameras? You had 16 cameras. Did you have one? You had one calibration for all of them, it seems. No, 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 no. It's each camera has individual calibration. Yeah, just using the same model for all of them, but each individual camera has its own calibration, and we do the calibration actually by jointly refining the parameters, the intrinsic and extrinsic parameters for all the cameras in the array. Understand how much variation is there from one camera to another? Uh, in this case, we didn't have that much. Yeah, but you know, with these cameras um, that have fairly high resolution, if you then try to use generic parameters, you, you get pretty big errors. Yeah, so there is some variation. That's what we started with, and then, then we improved it and added that non central part to it. So that's. With a subsequent improvement by Urban? Yeah, that, yeah, well, actually, I, I refer here to the model. Yeah, we went more around along the lines of the urban. So like when we were implementing, you know, the reprojection error cost function, we used the separate X and Y coordinates and, and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. There's an improvement on Saturday. Yeah, yeah. Okay, it's yeah. Not yeah. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the presentation from uh, Mohammed Baharul Islam, and his talk is on high mode, a hybrid monocular omnidirectional depth estimation model. Hello everyone, 
through the context, they just went there. We said effectively condensate the imperfect scanning and info loss in the drive tools and produce more recent depth traps with better visual quality and sharper edges. Experiments are all carried out on an NVIDIA GeForce RTX 2017 GPU using hybrid. The model is evaluated on three benchmark data sets of Matterport reading, Honorson CG, and Stanford 3. Quantitative results are presented following the standard evaluation protocols. We can observe that Hyman outperforms the other state of the art methods on almost all metrics, although it is trained directly on the small scale data sets and eliminating the burden of printing. In addition to the omnidirectional images, the effectiveness and increase of hardware in recovering the edge and object details are investigated on non panoramic images. Achieving the best results validates its high probabilities. Compared to the positive results, hardware produces a clear depth map with higher quality and sharper edges, which are increasingly even better in relatives in some regions. As evolution studies, our proposed platform is compared to four pre-trained models proving its superiority. Further experiments are conducted to investigate the effectiveness of spatial residual flaw and self-presentation mechanics on all three cases. Both models contribute notably to increased accuracy and decreased error. It is worth mentioning that each model of the proposed transformer plays a significant role in reducing the number of the parameters at the educational cost, as well as improving the performance. Among them, simultaneously adopting the special residual block and special temporal patches has a crucial impact. Furthermore, a proposed method successfully reconstructs the 3D structure by finding the coordinates and boundaries between walls, floor, and ceiling. In summary, efficient design of the modules and proper combination of them in our proposed model could effectively mitigate the distortion and computational cost while increasing the performance even on the small scale Please refer to our paper for more results and discussions. The code and the supplementary material are also publicly available through this day. Thank you for your attention. Uh, do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, so you, you said you use a scroll of the set. Do you think there is a what would be the end of size to say you can search everything for 360? Like here it's mostly indoors. Yeah. Like, in, yeah, sorry, the, the um, three data set I showed there. Okay, so we use that one is not enough for the model. So that why we said it is the small data set. Okay, so for large scale data set, probably the performance is good, but uh, this is small scale data set can compete the state of the art. So that why you claim the our model can perform the small scale data set. Thank you. Uh, sorry for video presentation because only eight minutes. I thought it's not possible, <laughs> so that I will record the video and present here. Just give the time for eight minutes. <laughs> any, question in the online, no? uh, any more questions? No. no. Thank you. Uh, next, we have the presentation from Antony on photometric visual gyroscope for full view spherical camera. Hi, hello everyone. So my name is Antoine André and I'm part of the CNRS uh, IAST uh, Joint Robotics Laboratory in Tsukuba, Japan. And today I will present you how we can use 
omnidirectional cameras to make some visual surveying. So for the outline, I will go through the classic one, classical one with the motivation, the methodology uh, behind this uh, photometric visual gyroscope. And uh, after I will present you the method and some results. And finally, I will conclude. So for the motivation, you, you know a lot about uh, 360 cameras and all they are convenient because they can, they can acquire a full view of the scene. And um, we can take advantage of this spherical projection to interpret the, the, the scene that is initially on the plane and elevate it on a sphere and just work on this sphere. And this provides us a large convergence domain. And so, yeah, that's uh, what I mean by this. Just taking uh, the two, uh, dual, the two uh, fisheye uh, images and project it on a sphere. And we have some, some field of applications related to this, like correction of spherical panoramic images, stabilizations of uh, videos, and robot estimations, robot motion esti estimation, sorry. And what we can do with this is work without any features, without any line or circle detection, and just going full photometric. Some other work have been done uh, this before, like uh, uh, the mixture of photometric potentials or just doing some phase co correlation stuff. And um, however, this provides only a poor accuracy on the angular resolution uh, within a limit of uh, plus minus uh, three degrees. And what we wanted to do is increase this resolution without losing the convergence domain because projecting on a sphere and working just on the sphere that you can rotate uh, is very convenient. So in order to do this, uh, what we do is classic uh, visual surveying uh, stuff, like minimizing a cost uh, through 11 by market uh, optimization law. So I won't go too much in the detail for this, um, but what you can see is at some point, we need to um, compute a, a gradient of the image to compute the matrix, the interaction matrix uh, that leaks the, um, the speed of the image to compute this subroing. And this image gradient, since it's not on the plane, we cannot compute it quite accurately. So what we did is, um, since we are working on a sphere, we just made it made uh, the neighborhood and uh, computed the gradient directly on the sphere. So to do this, we elevate one pixel uh, of the image plane, and after we search for its neighbors on the on the sphere directly, and that's where we compute the gradient that we put back in the equation uh, to compute our cost and minimize it to find the right alignment on the sphere. So uh, what we can do with this is um, now build our uh, gyroscope to align different images. And uh, what, what we did for this is um, an hybrid uh, approach because what we want to do uh, is to fit the pixels of the image on the sphere but since we're using an isocadron that we subdivided, there, is, there isn't enough uh, features on this sphere that matches the number of pixels of the images. So what we did is um, going dual and uh, using uh, first uh, by rescaling the images to the right number of pixels that match the ones that are on the sphere. We achieve a first um, estimation of the rotation and after we use uh, all the pixels of the images, uh, of the images, but since uh, there are a lot more, um, the convergence domain is quite narrow, but it is more precise. And that's why we mean by the hybrid uh, approach, since uh, we are using one uh, one first step where we are aligning rossly, and after we use the second step to affine and search a more resolute. Uh, um, uh, measure. So what we need to evaluate our method is take uh, some uh, images of the data set that is um, from the panoramis data set created just with uh, um, a dual fisheye camera, a Ricotita, and we made it turn around the robot with a robot and uh, we searched what was the resolution between each image and what we saw is uh, that we could achieve a zero point uh, 0.9 uh, degree accuracy. However, the computation time is quite uh, not 30 FPS, but yeah, some things to improve. 
And uh, we compared it to some other method, like uh, one mentioned previously, the MPP uh, for the mixture of potentials. And like I said earlier, we we have um, we only had like three degree uh, of uh, resolution with this method, and now we divide it uh, greatly with a 0.1 degree accuracy. And what we did also uh, is study the convergence domain of uh, this method. So we searched uh, mostly. Uh, how far we can align our images. And what we saw is that this hybrid approach is completely justified through this, since when we are using the rescaled images and the right number of features that matches the right number of pixels in the image, we can achieve a plus minus 45 degree uh, convergence domain. But when we are using the full um, pixel of the image, we can only achieve a plus minus uh, 12.5 degree uh, convergence domain. And that's why we justify it, since we're just first using the, the ROS approach to uh, rossly align uh, our image. And after we find uh, the precise alignment. But some other methods are greater convergence domain. We have the accuracy, but not the greatness uh, of the convergence domain. So it's something to, to improve. However, as you can see, maybe I. I I hope that it moved. I it doesn't move. Okay, so it won't be uh, useful, but you can uh, you can see the results in the in the paper. But initially, it was supposed to move, and you can see that uh, we can compensate the movement of the camera and have a still image, even if the other one is moving. Just uh, compensation. But and um, yes, to conclude uh, quickly. Um, what we proposed is a photometric visual gyroscope that was featureless since we are working only with the intensity of uh, the image that is cost efficient, but not so much because we can go, uh, go better uh, with high capability, especially in accuracy with a 0 0.09 degree accuracy, a great convergence domain of 45 degree, and uh, yeah, not, not fully uh, 30 FPS, but we're working on it. And uh, for the resources, the data set is available since it was published in a previous paper. And uh, the code is also available if you want to try. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, we have to improve the computing speed um, and uh, enhance the convergence domain. But uh, this is ongoing work, you know. And uh, finally, yeah, I'd like to thank you uh, for your attention and thank uh, the people that worked uh, with me in this project. So thank you. Yeah. yeah, so what we need is, is some, uh, the sum of error. That's uh, not uh, just uh, only on one angle, but we, uh, we made a, a normalized error around the three angles. And that's uh, 0 0.1 around the three angles, not just uh, around one. Thank you for your question. Oh, yeah, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Thank you. Thank you. Next, I would like to invite Jeffrey for presenting pose estimation for two view panoramas based on key point matching, a comparative study and critical analysis. Uh, hi, everyone. I am Jeffrey Murugara, and I will present my young work with my advisor, Claudio Young, and Professor Tiago Silveira, named Post estimation for two view panoramas based on a key point, a comparative study and critical analysis. We are from Federal University of Rio Grande do Sul. Uh, first, nowadays, spherical images are gaining popularity uh, because it allows interacting with the surroundings in a 360 fashion. 
for example, some of these application will be virtual reality, local lenses, and augmentation reality. On the other hand, post estimation could be crucial for task such 3D reconstruction, LIDAR, and layout recovery. In this work, we evaluate post estimation, uh, the traditional post estimation in spherical image swapping core components such as key point detection, post estimation, and optimization techniques. We evaluate that tanto in indoor image and outdoor image. So we make a contribution comparing in, res in resume, comparison of analysis of different key point matching algorithms for panoramas coupled with different linear and nonlinear approaches for post estimation. In particular, we first choose SIF and ORF algorithms as planar ones, superpoint as a planar deep learning one, and so on a spherical one. Then we adapt SIF or a superpoint to the sphere with tiny play post procedure. And for post recovery, we use eight point or five, five point algorithm plus optimization techniques such as nonlinear squares, SQ optimization, and the combination of the nonlinear squares with SQ optimization. In total, we test 56 pipelines. Uh, after we cover the post that is composed by the rotation matrix and a translation vector, uh, in the part of the translation vector, we can only retrieve the orientation. We compare them with the ground truth with angular errors denoted as R error and T error in the present slide after different acceptance thresholds. Uh, for our experiments, we need to collect a synthetic data set with two open software like Blender and Morality Engine. In the case of O'Reilly Engine, we use the Omni SCCB package that are available in Gipco. After that, we choose multiple lessons, and for each lesson, we pick a canonical view of each. And then we perform random translation in the model, in the 3D model, and a random rotation, and save the component of translation and rotation. Uh, finally, we spec manually the last image for the late image to where an object overlap the entire scene. Uh, for example, indoor image can be seen of A to E data sets and outdoor image for F to I data sets in the LA. Uh, for the experiments, uh, CIF and ORB were, were used at the implementation of OpenCV, Superpoint was a third party implementation and served for the official code. Uh, we also I use tangent plate a paper for the official code to adapt SIF or and superpoint, namely a test SIF, T orf and T tangent, well, no, TS as a point in the slide. Uh, for example, in the table, they represent the average number of key points, production but H descriptor and the station deviation with the proposed name for for shorter data tables and results. And uh, our first experiment, we want to measure the impact of realistic rotation and interpolate the rotation. Uh, the first one is a rotation made in a 3D model, but it, it is accurate, but it's slow. And the second one is faster, but introduces some artifacts. For example, in the right square of the image, the left that is interpolate rotation seems less clear than the second that is the realistic rotation. Uh, for this experiment, we choose a room data set and perform random uh, rotation among all the axes. Uh, result are present in the table two in this slide, and we can see that uh, for the first three threshold, rotation are complementary, being realistic rotation better for tangent shift, tangent uh, superpoint, tangent superpoint, and surf, and interpolate rotation for the other. But for a reasonable threshold, like 1%, uh, there are the results are, are all, almost the same. Uh, then we also want to evaluate the rotation and translation independently. So we pick uh, data sets for indoor or outdoor and apply random translation or rotation in, uh, in each scenario. Uh, result are present in table three and four. Uh, first show that the thresholds are different for rotation and translation being the rotation uh, threshold of rotation um, 0 .0, 0, 0 0.1 to 1, and for translation 1 to 20. 
Uh, we can conclude that the translation is harder than rotation. Fears for the results that the greater ones are better. And second for the threshold, that a threshold of translation are more permissive and, and, and the results are worse even that. Then we compare the full lesson of our pipeline first for indoor scenarios. That is uh, for all the data, indoor data set, we pick a random and, and random translation and random tra rotation by jointly. So we have to recover the post here. Uh, some of our conclusion are that tangent plane has important role in adjusting the local geometry of the sphere. For example, see tangent sieve versus sieve. In bottom image, tangent sieve is the red one and sieve is the orange one. Uh, for the part of optimization, uh, SQ optimization did not show a considerable accuracy gain, but the combination with nonlinear squares does. Please see the green uh, line and a brown line in the upper image. Uh, then we conduct the same experiment for outdoor scenarios, and we uh, we saw the similar behaviors than the previous experiment. But outdoor scenario seems to be more challenged than indoor because the lowest value for rotation or translation, for example, in that rotation, the indoor, the lowest value are 30, and in the lowest value of outdoor are 20. So it seems that outdoor scenes are more challenged than indoor. Uh, then we uh, run a computational cost experiment uh, for all, all those awful algorithms with uh, some, some schemes with GPU, with GPU, and uh, measure the times of the post recovery and pre pre processing times. Uh, we can conclude that tangent play procedure is an overhead that depends on the very descriptor, for example, C and C in the red square. And this can be uh, for number of key points of the complex of the algorithm, for example, this is a super point and tangent super point have a over, um, more strong over overhead because it re relies much in the GPU. Uh, then post recovery running methods are done by the eight point algorithm and pre and post processing strategy, uh, strategies doesn't have a considerable overhead. In conclusions, interpolar rotation seems beneficial for certain methods but for um, a real experiments, the choice of interpolar rotation or realistic what does not impact the results, uh, less for this task, the post, this task, this task. Uh, outdoors is more challenge than indoor data set, potentially because of infinite distance and rotation only experiments since a, since a solved problem, but incorporate translation makes post estimation harder. In summary, our results indicate that the, NL, the combination of nonlinear square plus SQ are the best optimization, and tangent sieve and SORF attain the most competitive results. Uh, thank you for your attention. I am happy to answer any question and uh, or code as available in the GitHub line, link, and the benchmark will be available soon. So I wonder, the have you ever looked into the difference in the distribution of the indoor data set and outdoor data set? I mean, like uh, the features yes. oh. uh, near the poles. Near the um, for example, the near the poles in the outdoor image is much more the sky that in the render, for example, Blender and in Rail CV, the sky are managed with infinite distance. So this may affect the results also. But in a real scenario, bueno, the, it's hard to imagine which distance is the sky also. Uh, will be available. It's still under you know, some issues with that university for, for a repository. In the, but it will be available. Thank you.
next we would like to pre uh, invite Qutin to present simplifying polar invariance for neural network applications to vision based irradiance forecasting. Uh, this is also the best paper selected for the award. Wait. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Oh, wait. Where is it? Uh, yeah, we can hear. Wait, it's. <laughs> um... Okay, now it's good. I think. Perfect. All right. So thank you very much uh, for being here and thank you to the organizers. Uh, so in this study, we show the benefit for convolutional uh, neural networks of representing scene, uh, so rotational invariant scenes with polar coordinates. And we applied this uh, method to two vision-based irradiance forecasting approaches from sky images on the left and satellite images on the right. So um, predicting the future is critical to better integrate solar energy into the energy grid. Uh, as you can see in this uh, short video taken by an hemisphere called Sky Camera, rapid changes in the cloud cover conditions cause large irradiant shifts, making solar energy quite unreliable. However, anticipating these events would give time to adapt the response of the electric network. Many studies uh, on solar energy have successfully uh, applied uh, neural networks to address these tasks, so computer vision tasks like uh, sky image segmentation, cloud tracking, or video prediction. Let's consider here the task of sky image classification, for instance. Because of the shift in variance of CNNs, uh, a deep learning classifier would be able to classify that image as sun, regardless of the position of the sun uh, in the image. Same here, if we had clouds in the image, the position of object would not impact the prediction of the classifier. When it comes to irradiance forecasting, however, some uh, special features are, are quite important. For instance, the position of the sun in the image um, is, yeah, is key. So the closer the sun to the center of the image, the higher it is in the sky, the closer to the uh, zenith, so the higher the local uh, irradiance. Another key aspect is the position of clouds relative to the sun. So in fact, if we know how much irradiance we're getting at time t, uh, the additional source of viability uh, comes from clouds, so um, which means that the, the prediction of solar energy is invariant by translation of this uh, uh, sun cloud configuration. Furthermore, because the direction from which clouds approach the sun has no impact on the local irradiance change, uh, the task can also be considered as approximately rotational invariant, and I think that's the main uh, idea of this presentation. So this interesting property can be leveraged uh, using uh, uh, data augmentation. So the standard technique in computer vision, we show the model diverse um, uh, sun cloud configuration to the model, which learns from yeah, this, uh, of these different uh, uh, sun cloud configurations. Another approach is to turn the rotational invariance of the problem into a shift invariance by representing the scene with polar coordinates centered on the sun. And with this new configuration, the task is invariant by vertical translation. Uh, thus, for a given sun cloud uh, special configuration, uh, well, this can be learned from a single image without having to augment the data. And the same technique can be used for satellite images. So imagine it's, uh, it's a satellite image on the left with a solar farm in the middle of the image. It's also a, a uh, environment by rotation around the solar farm so you can turn the, the image you can represent this uh, scene with uh, polar coordinates and benefit from the same properties so in this study we compare uh, raw sky images with the circumsolar area which is a close-up on the sun a sun-centered uh, sky image uh, sky representation and the polar coordinates uh, spin and for, for some of the scene representation, we use a, an image-based sun tracker uh, to uh, know where the sun is, even if it's hidden by clouds. Uh, without getting too much into the detail, we use a, a deep learning model 
uh, called Eclipse to, uh, to compare the different scene representations. So the model extracts special temporal features and then uh, iteratively predict future states, which are decoded into uh, future sky segmentation and corresponding uh, evidence values. So here are the results. So we use the forecast scale metric to compare these, to, to compare the different uh, scene representations. So this matrix is, corresponds to a, a relative uh, performance increase of, of the model we are studying compared to a baseline, which is the persistence model here. So the higher the forecast scale, the better. And you can see that the polar representation is the best uh, on all three horizons, especially on the sh very short term horizon which is also due to the fact that the polar coordinates induce a distortion, which magnifies the area closer to the sun. So it gives more details on the sun and on clouds, which are very close to the sun, which is, as you can imagine, quite important for a short term, a very short term uh, evidence forecasting. We obtain similar results with uh, satellite uh, images. So uh, the polar representation is the best uh, with or without uh, that documentation. So, uh, data augmentation, which means here rotations around the solar farm for the raw image and vertical translation for the polar coordinates. Uh, another key finding is that uh, the model trains much faster on the polar representation. So in practice, equivalent uh, rotated version of the same uh, of a given uh, scene can be learned from a, a single uh, uh, like scene representation, single image with polar coordinates, uh, which explain this difference uh, in, in training time. Another uh, observable property of the evidence forecasting task is that the prediction uh, is that predicting the past uh, is as challenging as predicting the future from a given sequence of sky images. So to augment the data further, we randomly flip during training the images and yeah, predict the past instead of the future instead of the future, which gives an additional gain on all three horizons. Um, finally, um, a quick uh, principle component analysis we performed on the uh, spatial temporal uh, representation encoded by the neural network. Um, so we want to see here what the model uh, is actually uh, looking at in these uh, 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 scenes representing with polar coordinates. So the principal component corresponds here to the uh, extent of the cloud coverage. So from uh, fully cloudy on the left to fully clear on the right. Um, the second uh, component uh, is the vertical position of the black area. Um, yeah, so from, uh, yeah top to, to bottom here. And interestingly, the third one, uh, following one is uh, also correspond to the position of the black area, but here the, the horizontal extent. And uh, if you think about it, uh, this position of the black area corresponds to the position in the sun of the sun in the sky. So uh, what time of the day it is or how far it is from the horizon. Uh, yeah, so you can uh, uh, yeah, find this kind of information from, the, from knowing the position or extent of the black uh, area. And the fourth component corresponds to the special variability of the cloud cover. So on the left, uh, it's fully clear, but also fully cloudy. So no variability, which means uh, little uh, irradiance uh, variability. And on the right, uh, ex uh, you can see uh, some uh, extremely viable conditions. Uh, so 50-50 uh, between clouds and, and, and the sky, so extremely viable uh, conditions. So in this study, we show the benefit of representing the scenes with polar coordinates. Uh, for two vision-based solar forecasting tasks. Uh, we hope that this research, research will benefit other polar invariant computer vision problems. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Kutin, for your presentation. Uh, do we have any questions? Hey, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I was wondering uh, for spin, did you also measure the segmentation accuracy? Like the baseline model Eclipse had um, some measurement of mean IU. 
So were you able to measure the performance there? Um, well, yeah, I think it wouldn't be as straightforward because, uh, um, because of the distortion induced by the polar representation. Uh, so you get a lot more pixel uh, closer to the sun. You mean comparing with the with the raw uh, sky image, for instance? Okay, thanks. Thank you for presenting. Thank you. Can I stop sharing or is there another question? Yeah, I, I think this is all. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, I would like to call Yu Hui for presenting rethinking supervised depth estimation for 360 panoramic imagery. Um, so thank you. Uh, thanks for uh, thank uh, the organizer uh, and uh, uh, hello everyone. So my topic is rethinking supervised depth estimation for three thirty three sixty panoramic imaginary. So this work is collaborated with Bing, Yangming, Hai Chao, Kalin, Weiwei, Shan, in in and Media Lab. And uh, Okay, yeah. So here is the here is the the depth estimation task. So given a panorama image, the task of the panorama depth estimation is to predict a dense, dense pixel level distance between each pixel to the camera center. So uh, some recent works are backfields and the whole night. So the, the backfields adapt two branches. Uh, network uh, to leverage leveraging two different projection. One is the panorama projection. One is a cube map projection. Pro in projection, and uh, for each project projection, they use the encoder decoder model uh, architecture, and uh, they also use the the fusion uh, the the fusion strategy to to balance the feature map from the two pro two projection. And the whole night uh, also used an encoder decoder model for panor panorama image. They encoded the panorama column wise, and uh, they called it the latent horizontal feature. That uh, uh, yeah, and then decode the latent horizontal feature to the depth column wise. Col column wise. Okay, so here here is the. Uh, so uh, our proposal model and the recent work sh shows that multi-model uh, training helps to improve the generalization of feature encode, so thus improve the depth accuracy. So we use a similar strategy with, uh, and uh, we uh, train the network with um, uh, with the ResNet 15 backbone and the uh, three different branches. And the uh, one is a depth branch, one is a normal branch, and one is a flame, flame branch. So, so we use the right net uh, backbone just is just for the fair comparison with the uh, whole net and backfields as they, they also use the same backbone. And uh, here's the, and uh, we use three lightweight uh, decoder with the ASPP model that's uh, which deep lab used for multi-task branch. And for the depth branch, it's a regression network with smooth L1 loss. And the normal branch is a classification network just predict whether the the plan, the normal is in horizontal or vertical or neither of them. And the plane network is predict the, the boundary, the mask boundary of the each plane. We generate the normal and the plane, the normal and the plane ground truth from, from the depth information by the open 3D tools. So after that, we train the network and uh, uh, yeah, we train the network on two different data sets. One is the Matplos 3D and one is the Stanford 2D 3D. Here are the, the samples of that. 
So, okay, yeah, the result uh, here is the matrix steps. So that's uh, uh, okay. So we compared to the previous works and everything looks good and we reach a state of art. But, uh, but uh, when you go deeper with, uh, with the evaluation evalu matrix, even with Delta 1 and the Delta 2, we want to, uh, so they are kind of loose. So we want to check a tighter matrix, like something like Delta 0 0.5 and Delta 0 0.25. Uh, so we want to check them are good or not. So then uh, we evaluation on these two matrix. We find that the uh, as the margin be tight, so the the performance drop dramatically. So so let's uh, the performance uh, yeah, and uh, that that's because uh, we may think that that's delta zero for zero two five. It uh, has a tight emergency, tight, uh, I'm, I'm, uh, tight tight margin, and delta one has a. Uh, uh, a loose margin, so take a four meter size and example. Example, so the the, the delta zero zero point two five only maybe have five to six percent error, but delta one has a, a, around a twenty percent to twenty five percent error. So uh, the value matrix in delta one may not as accurate enough in in the case of multi multi panel view or stitching together. So how, how can we improve the data with the tight margin? So, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, after that, I may think uh, here's the toy example. So uh, uh, to, uh, to illustrate the depth and ambiguity. So here, uh, here uh, center C, let's suppose center C is the camera center and here uh, uh, the blue, um, blue trapezoid B and and uh, the red trapezoid A uh, has the same uh, as uh, are centered at at the C. I, I take the center at C and uh, has a similar shapes, but they have different depth, different distance, different depth. And uh, during the panorama projection, they have the same per, uh, parameter. Uh, they have the same per, um, panorama, and are and the learner model maybe learn something like uh, in the in the blue one in the right hand in the right hand and uh, maybe uh, with a different scale d has a, uh, maybe is greater than d2 and uh, less than d1 so that means if the d1 and uh, if the the d1 and the d2 has a similar gaps so the maybe the d is more accurate and if they have a big gap, so the data uh, that may cause some error, in, uh, some problem drops in data. And uh, af after we think about this, we try uh, to try to normalize the 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 uh, the parameter uh, parameter depth. So that in that case like that. So if the D1, D1 and the D2 are equal, uh, equal to each other, that means A and B are exactly the same. So, uh, ah, okay, sorry. Oh. Yeah, how do we find the scale, the scale that, oh, then we think, when we think that the camera height, that the camera, uh, the camera center to the, the peak to the distance of the floor plan that that may be a, a good anchor to to scale it so that's why so we uh, and uh, then how do we find the camera height then we estimate the floor floor plan and the the camera height is the distance between the camera center to the floor plan so after that we evaluate uh, we train on our normalized steps and we find that the performance drop not not uh, com compared to the metric depth original one, so it drop not much significantly. So, and uh, here is the some examples that we compare to the Java the method. 
So here is a parallel uh, image and the depth between, uh, here is the depth of Bifios and the whole net. And we can see that our model is uh, uh, visualized that's good that compared to the other uh, methods. And we can still even find some uh, something that Grunch doesn't have. You know. And uh, yeah, thank you. Any question? Thank you for presenting. Uh, do we have any questions? Um, yeah. So uh, do you have an example, uh, or could you describe qualitatively how your prediction behave on a scenario where your data, like training data wasn't, like, like for instance, an indoor car, Something that is not a like an indoor mobility, or I saw like an exterior, like the outdoors, but I couldn't see like how well compared to because in your network you have also normals, you have the training and you have segmentation and uh, and those data sets. I think they are only periods. so. How, how did it learn for the outdoor scenes? And if you have ever tried something very different, like they say like a confined space, like the interior of a car. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, so uh, uh, does it mean, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I, I, maybe it, it, you got the, something like that the normal maybe cannot get us uh, during the outside scene that, that uh, maybe some, Steps in the out, out, outdoor cannot be seen. Is that right? Yeah. So, can, uh, so currently in, in our model, we gen, uh, we generate the model by uh, from the indoor data set and for the outdoor data set, the normal uh, is uh, as uh, the depth may not. Uh, for some case, they are far far away. They cannot uh, get the depth, so there is no normal there. For for that case, we don't uh, we we only generate norm always the depth information. So for the uh, for the one without depth, there is no no normal, and uh, we don't uh, we ignore during the uh, we ignore that case that pixel during training. Thank you for your answer and your presentation. Thank you. Uh, next, I would like to invite Heising to present 3D room layout recovery generaliz generalizing across Manhattan and non-Manhattan worlds. OK, I will share my PPT. Okay, can you see my screen? Uh, yes, we can. Okay. Um, the title of this paper is 3D Room Layout Recovery, Generalizing Across Manhattan and Non-Manhattan Worlds. In room layout recovery research, a room is assumed to be an Atlanta layout with a horizontal floor, ceiling, and vertical walls. Atlanta layout is further divided into Manhattan and non-Manhattan layouts based on whether the vertical walls are orthogonal to each other. And the room layout technology is to predict the indoor geometric structure from images like 316 panoramas. The existing methods mostly concentrate on Manhattan layouts. They extract feature, uh, layout features by deep neural network, then the Manhattan assumption-based post-processing is applied. Although these methods recover excellent Manhattan layout, and they fail once encountering non-Manhattan cases. 
Now Manhattan Room Layout Recovery is a challenging topic due to its complexity and the lack of non-Manhattan data sets. In order to relax the Manhattan, non um, in, in order to relax the Manhattan layout to arbitrary shapes, uh, some works just approximate a simple polygon as a room layout, which introduces new problems, such as it is impossible to recover the occluded areas and refine the right angle structures. And another problem is there are many false alarms of walls recovery. As far as I know, no one sort of method works for both Manhattan and non-Manhattan layouts. And this paper proposed a new room layout recovery method that, that generalizes across Manhattan and non-Manhattan work. Motivations. In addition to the regular layout elements, like the ceiling, floor, and wall, wall boundaries, we think the room layout types should be learned by the neural network. Then, in this manner, an adaptive post-processing can be applied to handle the layout of the arbitrary shapes. And the room layout type can be inferred from the surface the surface normal of the walls. Network architecture. The input panorama image is first fed into a residual neural network to extract features on four different scales. Then for each feature from the pyramid, a sequence of convolutional layers is applied to gradually compress the feature hat. Then we can obtain the horizontal feature by concatenating them together. In order to capture the global features and the long-term dependencies, um, bi-directional LSTM is adopted later. Our network jointly um, predicts the ceiling boundary, the floor boundary, and the wall wall existence and the wall surface normal. Surface normal re uh, representation. Uh, for layout recovery problem, and the surface normals of all the objects are not, are not necessary. Only the surface normal of the walls are required. So we propose to calculate the surface normal ground truth from the layout corners by 3D projection methods. In this manner, the only labels of this work are the layout corners. So and then uh, from the network outputs, we can easily obtain Manhattan and non or non-Manhattan wall surface uh, results. In this case, uh, wall surface DE and FG are non-Manhattan surfaces, and the other walls are Manhattan surfaces. So adaptive post-processing strategies are applied to different wall surfaces on the floor pro projection wheel. For the Manhattan surfaces, the Manhattan assumption based post processing is applied so that the occluded corner P1 dash is predicted. For the non Manhattan surfaces, uh, we adopt the projective uh, walls result directly. Evaluation on non Manhattan layout. Uh, from this table, we can find that the layout recovery accuracy of our method is, is significantly higher than the non-Manhattan method. And the junction by our method is better than the non-Manhattan method, which means that uh, there are less false alarm walls in our results. And the qualitative results also support our conclusions.
the evaluation of generalization ability. Um, these comparisons demonstrate that our method achieves better accuracy on non Manhattan layouts and gets a boost of um, 0.59% in 2D LU and 0.61% in 3D LU overall, indicating that our method generalizes across Manhattan and non Manhattan words very well. Qualitative evaluation. At the beginning of this presentation, we listed some problems of the existing methods. Now let's look at the performance of, of our method on these problems. Uh, apparently, our method tackled the problem like uh, false alarm results of the walls recovery. And our method can recover the small structures and the occluded areas. Also, our method can recover the non-Manhattan areas. Conclusion, without introducing additional supervision, we extend current Manhattan room layout recovery methods to the Atlanta world. Our network not only estimates uh, regular layout elements like ceiling, floor, and wall, wall boundaries, but also estimates addition, additional surface normal to indicate the rough structure of the room, such as which, wall, which walls are Manhattan or non-Manhattan surfaces, which are further, further used in uh, adaptive post-processing to reconstruct the layout of arbitrary shapes. The, exper the experimental results demonstra demonstrate that our method has a good, has a great improvement on non Manhattan layouts, while keep being capable of generalizing across Manhattan and non Manhattan worlds. Okay, that's all. Thanks. Thanks for your time. <laughs> Thank you, Haijing. Uh, do we have any questions for you? Uh, we have one on chat, so I'll read it for everyone. What is the precision and recall of non-Manhattan wall prediction? Uh, actually, as a evaluation in room layout recovery uh, research, is not precision and recall. Uh, the, the evaluation matrix in this field is 2D LU, 3D LU, um, corner error, and uh, pixel errors. And uh, from this uh, table, we can see that uh, the layout recovery accuracy or um, our method is significantly higher than, uh, than current SOTA methods. Uh, thanks for the information. Uh, uh, my, um, what I'm interested in is that uh, I know you are using the norm to predict whether the wall is uh, is uh, Manhattan or non Manhattan. So I'm curious, what is your like the true possible rate or false possible rate for your predictions for a wall as a non Manhattan wall or either Manhattan wall? Okay. Um, for this, pro uh, for for this questions. I didn't um, did uh, I didn't did this uh, evaluation for uh, for, uh, for normal. Oh, okay, thank you. Oh, okay, thanks for your question. Do we have any more questions? Uh, thank you, Ajin, for your presentation. Thank you. Next, I would like to call Putkit Gera for his presentation on casual radiance capture and synthesis for indoor scenes. Um, hello, am I audible? 
Uh, yeah, if you want. Um, okay, I'll just share my screen. Um, yeah. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Pulkit Gera, and I'll be presenting our work, Casual Radiance Capture and Synthesis for Indoor Scenes. This work was done along Mohamed Reza Karimi, Charles Renault, Professor PJ Narayanan, and Professor Jean-Francois Lalonde. So what is the goal of our project? The goal of our project is that given a set of captured panoramas that are captured casually using an off-the-shelf uh, camera that you can see on the left, we want to perform novel view synthesis, that is view the uh, indoor scene from any viewpoint in the scene. Along with that, what we want to do is capture the radiance of the scene. Capturing radiance is an important step for AR VR applications as it enables immersive scene uh, visualization as well as uh, realistic scene augmentation. Our approach can render 360 degree HDR light probes from novel viewpoints which enable correct lighting for virtual objects that are inserted into the scene. So let us have a look at some of the background. HDR estimation can be done from a bunch of LDR images in two methods. The first method involves using multiple LDR images that are captured at different exposures. This was proposed by Debevec in 1998. However, this leads to ghosting artifacts and requires a lot of special setup to capture those LDR images at multiple exposures and is not very scalable for when you want to capture multiple HDR images in an indoor scene. The other approach is estimating it from a single image. Uh, but the issue with that is that the quality uh, obtained of the HDR estimates is poorer than the previous version and we obtain a very limited dynamic range. So let us have a look at this network, Luminous Attention Network that was proposed in 2021. It is a multitask network where one of the tasks is to create an attention map for overexposed regions. This attention mask is uh, used in uh, estimating HDR values from the input LDR. We also use the luminance scale invariant MSC loss to estimate the HDR intensities. In addition, we also use neural radiance fields as the base for our project. Neural radiance fields on nerves encode a 3D scene in an MLP. And once we have encoded, we can look at it from novel viewpoints. The basic idea is we shoot a ray from a pixel. And on that ray, we sample multiple points. For each of those points, we query the MLP, what is the color and density and volume density and then we combine all these uh, information from all these points to get the pixel color and density. Let's have a look at some of the related works which try to capture the radiance from some scene. Real-time virtual object insertion that was proposed by Tarko et al in uh, 2019. What they do is they take an omnidirectional video as input and try to insert virtual objects in that with correct shading. However, they can only do it on, for the captured frames and not for any novel viewpoint. We also look at Nerf in the Dark or Raw Nerf, which is proposed in this uh, conference itself. And what it does is trains Nerf directly on linear raw HDR input data. We will show later how this data is not sufficient for our problem. So let us have a look at our pipeline. So first, we capture LDR panoramas as, and the images are like this as shown here. We then generate masks to remove the subject or the guy who is uh, capturing the images. We estimate camera poses using OpenSFM. We, de uh, we then have a LDR to HDR module which estimates HDR panoramas. These HDR panoramas serve as ground truth for uh, training the NERF module. And this is what it, uh, basically it looks like. So we have the input LDR panoramas. The LDR to HDR module estimates the HDR panoramas. These HDR panoramas are used to train the pano HDR nerve, which will predict a no which will predict an HDR panorama from a novel viewpoint. Yeah, so the LDR to HDR module recovers the overexposed HDR intensities from LDR panoramas, and we use LNet architecture to recover the HDR images. In addition to scale invariant MSC loss, we also use a render loss. Basically what we do is we have, we render a small image of resolution 64 cross 128 uh, with the ground truth HDR and the predicted HDR. And we take an MSC loss on the rendered images. This helps the network guide on how the coloring should be and how the spatial awareness of the color should be. Since, since we are dealing with indoor scenes, the HDR intensities uh, range rapidly through the scene. 
We train the network on Laval Indoor HDR dataset, which has over 2000 HDR panoramas. We also have six, we capture six scenes, uh, and out of which, uh, for every, each of those six scenes, we capture 10 HDR panoramas for evaluation. However, we observe that th this network doesn't really perform well on those 10 HDR panoramas since they're captured using two different sensors. So therefore we observe a domain gap. In order to alleviate that domain gap, we further fine tune our network on 78 HDR panoramas that are captured by the same camera used for our uh, scenes. I'll just uh, show what I mean. So the domain gap actually, uh, what happens is that uh, if we take a LDR to HDR pre-trained network that is trained on the Laval indoor dataset, we see that it is able to recover some HDR intensities and perform significantly better than just using input LDR. However, fine tuning improves the result even more and gets us closer. We can see that in these qualitative results, the L, uh, with the shadows and how the lighting is shaded, although there is some color mismatch, our fine tuning helps us get closer to the ground truth and gets us and uh, serves as a very good proxy for HDR ground truth. We then move on to our pano HDR nerf. What we uh, formulate this problem as uh, predicting the radiance and volume density at any given 3D point in the scene. We employ Nerf plus plus, which was proposed in 2020 as our base, since we are dealing with an unbounded indoor scene. And we also incorporate ideas like cone casting and integrated positional encoding from MIPNERF. Since we are dealing with omnidirectional images, we need to employ spherical sampling since points in the uh, pixels in the middle are not as same as the pixels uh, that are there in the top of the image or the bottom row as the top of the image uh, pixels correspond to the single point which is not true for the pixels in the middle so we need to uh, use spherical sampling in this case and the nerve loss that we define between the predicted radiance E cap and the ground truth radiance E is defined as an MSE loss between capital E cap and uh, capital E where capital E is log of 1 plus E and this is taken for all pixels across all images. So enough of talking and let's look at some of the results. So we, we compare our results with Nerf++ and Pano HDR Nerf. As you can see over here, that Pano HDR Nerf, that is our method, is able to recover the radiance. And this radiance is also spatially aware, as you can see by the shadows that are there, uh, that can be observed. And these are very hard shadows, which are not uh, present in the Nerf++ variant. This can be seen across all scenes. We also uh, perform an ablation where instead of taking the loss in log space, we take it in the linear space. And as you can see, there are a lot of floating artifacts and the qu visual quality of results are very poor. And these are the quantitative analysis for the same. And you can see that uh, taking loss in the linear space uh, is significantly worse than taking loss in the log space. We also compare it with raw nerf and we understand that uh, raw images which are used for training raw nerf do, no, uh, do not have that full dynamic range uh, for indoor scenes that is required for our task. And as you can see over here where we compare a raw image with the network output and you can see that how much uh, the network output, uh, how rich the network output is as compared to a single raw image. Some more results on other scenes. This can, this is a chess room scene. And as you can see, as we walk around the scene, the shadows keep moving. This is cafeteria. Whenever we'll come under a spotlight, we can see that the uh, scene gets brighter. So therefore we are able to capture uh, the radiance accurately. This is stairway. Some future directions. So we want to improve the quality as some of the artifacts or the floaters that you saw, they were caused by the uh, shadows of the photographer, which are not consistent across all images. So we want to model these shadows uh, similar to how Nerf W does with the non-static regions. We want to generalize the sensor for the LDR to HDR module. Currently, we need to fine tune it uh, for the sensor that we are using to capture the uh, HDR pairs for uh, the scenes that we are evaluating on. So we want to remove that limitation from uh, our method. Finally, we, uh, we want to learn radiance directly instead of you know learning a LDR to HDR module separately and a NERF module separately, and also enable material editing and relighting in the scene. 
and thank you and we are open for questions uh, do we have any questions thank you uh, i have one so regarding the sampling of the image uh, are you capturing one image every two meters one met one meter can you comment on that on the results i'm sorry could you please repeat your question maybe you can. Yeah, my, my question is with the impact of the image density uh, can you comment what would happen if you take one image every two meters uh, on the the impact on the estimation um, okay uh, so uh, from what I, uh, yeah so are you talking about the quality of the view synthesis or the quality of radiance capture yeah for the view synthesis okay so uh, yeah so view synthesis results would significantly degrade uh, if we have like less number of images and there is a uh, entire field of study that is dedicated to sparse uh, learning novel view synthesis in uh, uh, with sparse images so in that case we would need some more priors like you know depth and all uh, so yeah there are some works uh, which i can point you towards uh, like reg nerve and all which and ds nerve which work with sparse images like three or four images only and they work well in addition uh, for omnidirectional views there is uh, there are some works which try to uh, learn novel view synthesis from just a single image uh, but they are very limited because they only uh, are one they need depth and two uh, they are only able to perform view synthesis when in a translate uh, like a for a translatory motion whereas we are uh, we can do free hand capture and you can move around freely in the room so from any point you can uh, see the room basically so yeah that's about it hope that answers thank you thank you thank you thanks Pulkit, for presenting thanks and answering the question yeah. okay thanks a lot So this was it from our author presentation. I would like to thank all the attendees and participants uh, to joining our workshop and making it a great success. And hope everyone enjoys the rest of the CVPR conference. Thank you.